Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining today's uh, YouTube Live and Facebook Live and Instagram Live for uh, February 15th in the US and the 16th here in Australia. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, I know we've already sort of got a few uh, super chats um, that people put forward. So thank you very much for that. Um, and yeah, and just thank you all just for joining. It's always good to see everybody. Um, if you could let me know in the chat where everyone's calling in from, it's always great to see where, where everyone's, um, yeah, where everyone's calling in from and and uh, and how they're doing and everything like that. So thank you, everybody. And first question off the rank is uh, from Renar, who says, uh, hello, Dr. Chafee. Could you explain the biological reason behind shedding of baby teeth? Thank you. Um, that is a, that is an excellent question. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, it's not something that I've uh, looked too too closely into. Um, it's um, you know I mean they're they're called milk teeth, so it could be that that's just those teeth start coming in early on. You're still nursing, and you don't want to have you know teeth that are going to be too rough on on mom to nurse. But also if you think about it, you know just thinking about it right now, teeth don't grow, right? And so if you get your full adult teeth in when your head is really small, it's like, it's just, that's not gonna fit. As you have to wait for your your face to grow more before you get your permanent teeth in that are gonna be the right size for your head. So if you had just, if you were just your baby teeth came in because you need teeth from early on because you're gonna, you're gonna come off milk and you're gonna need to start eating actual food. And if you don't, um, if you don't have teeth, you can't do that. Uh, generally, there's a lot of animals that don't have teeth, but you know, for the ones that do. And so, if you just kept your baby teeth and at an adult head, they'd be very small and they'd be spaced out, and they wouldn't be as functional. So those need to fall out, and then bigger teeth, you know, more adult face would come in. So that's my thought behind that. I would expect that that's probably something to do with it, but it's, that's just me spitballing off the top of my head. So I don't know. <laughs> no, it's actually, and, but the thing is too, like, do we really know, know some of these things? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but um, you know, it's, it's, it's as good an explanation as any, I guess. Uh, Sunshine Kiss, thank you for the super chat. Dr. Chafee, could iodine supplements cause high blood pressure? Um, isn't it better to eat leafy vegetables to get nutrients over chemical supplements? Thanks. Uh, yeah, well, look, it's, um, it depends. It depends on the, on the leafy green. It depends on the nutrient. Um, you sort of the difference between, between pharmaceuticals and, and, uh, uh, you know, plant medicine, right? So do you want to take an aspirin or do you want to chew on willow bark? Do you want to take digitalis or do you want to you know, eat foxglove? Right, because the thing is, is that you you might get the you might get the a, a nutrient or a medicine from plants, but that's not the only thing that's coming with it. So you get the bad with the good. Um, you don't know the dose. You don't know how much you're getting. You don't know the conditions that it was grown in or how it was, um, you know, how with the soil quality and all these other sorts of things, which are a factor in in the nutrient levels and all that sort of stuff, and then the toxic levels of these different sorts of plants um you know so i mean potentially but the thing is is that um if you want like a dedicated nutrient source then and you're missing out on iodine but everything else is okay it's not that end of the world to take some iodine i don't know of it causing high blood pressure i wouldn't expect it to iodine is it's fairly safe you know people in japan uh eat a lot of seafood with a lot of iodine so they'll they're, they're taking in their daily amount of iodine that is much higher than other people even take supplements, you know? So when we say like take X amount of iodine supplements, they're just, their diet is bringing in more than that. Okay. So is that, it's, so it seems to be fairly safe to take. Um, but no, I agree. You should, it's ideal to get your nutrition from food, but Food is species specific and food for humans is meat. And that's just what we're designed to eat. So getting nutrients from leafy greens, you can get nutrients from them. They're about one third of the nutrients that they had in the 1950s because 
we're destroying the soil we're destroying the earth by growing these crops and just mass producing crops year after year after year and not letting them go back to the land and not letting animals come back on it and refertilize it and revitalize the soil um and so you know that's not uh that's not as healthy as it could have been and it and it gets the bad things as well so you get the bad with the good you're not just getting you know iodine or, or any of the other sort of uh, nutrients you're getting a lot of other things with it you know it, it would be ideal to get your iodine from meat if you're just eating meat and most people do you know i haven't had any problems with my iodine and i have i haven't specifically chased after cows that live on the coast i've just eaten what was available and that was fine for me if someone has a, a deficiency in that because of the soil sample or how something was raised or grown or something like that you know take you know trying to change up where you get your food and your meat probably uh reasonable but if you need a dedicated supplement that's fine too you know unfortunately we're not eating wild animals anymore and you're know, more the pity and you know not all cattle are being raised in a regenerative fashion and when they are and they're just being fed grass they're much more healthy they have a much higher nutrient density and that's great and that's what should be preferred and if you have access to that you should support ranchers and farmers that do that not everybody can but that's uh, that's very beneficial so you know to answer your question you know is it better to get it from leafy greens i don't actually think so because the the leafy greens will have things that are harmful and you don't actually know how much nutrients you're getting and those nutrients might be bound up in ways that you can't access they don't have bioavailability and then they'll have anti-nutrients which will strip out and, and bind out other nutrients that you're trying to absorb and they'll have things that can be directly toxic that aren't going to be helpful for you at all and so i think it probably is safer just to take iodine as opposed to take getting that from a leafy green i think it's best to get it from meat but if you have to take a sub if i had a choice between an iodine supplement and a leafy green i would definitely take the supplement thankfully i don't have that issue though i haven't had to take any iodine supplements personally other people may uh daniel s thank you very much for the super chat uh daniel says uh hi from austria well hello can a chronic Chronically gastritis, esophagitis, and SIBO be healed by a carnivore diet. They are always telling that you may not eat fats when having that issue. Um, do you know patients who have healed? Uh, yes, I, I've definitely seen that. There are even case series in the literature. You know, small case series isn't the whole study. It's just it was just reporting on several people that have had experience with these sorts of things. Um, and uh, one was, a, well, it was a sort of a smaller study, it was like six people and uh, with SIBO. And they uh, put them on a car, specifically a carnivore diet. And five of them were able to go, you know, sort of longer than a month. And um, one only sort of went like two weeks or so on it. And the ones that were able to go longer than a month, I'm remembering correctly, they, they all sort of had resolution of their SIBO and the one that only made it two weeks, I uh, had significant improvement. So that's good. Uh, gastritis, a lot of people, at least from, from a, a esophageal reflux disease point of view are benefited by things like carnivore diet um, and just ketogenic diets in, 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 in uh, general. And those seem to be uh, benefited by this and that that's uh, in the literature as well esophagitis and so again chron chronic gastritis you know it depends on what's causing that it can be you know helped by you know reducing the damage and pressure of the uh, on the stomach and increasing the defenses on the stomach but if you have gastritis and it's and it's there you know you might need some help from a doctor as well and um, you know, taking PPIs and other sorts of things to try to calm things down so that your stomach will have a chance to heal. So it may not just get rid of everything. It does seem to help with gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, esophagitis depends on the cause. So a lot of these things depend on the cause. SIBO, I mean, there's, I mean, literally zero evidence that any of those things get worsened by fats. I mean, it's just, a, that's just a blind accusation. The 
a lot of the SIBO bugs are ones that that feed on carbohydrates and fiber. So why would eating fat be a problem for that? It wouldn't. And so, you know, no, this that, that's just wild speculation on whoever on on the part of whoever said that. So no, I, I don't think that that's, that's something that you're going to worsen by eating animal fats. You eat a bunch of polyunsaturated seed oils, God knows what's going to happen to you. It's probably not going to be good though. And so um, it can potentially help with the first two. It depends on the cause of the esophagitis clearly. It depends on how bad your gastritis is and if you may need a little help from you know, a doctor with medications. SIBO uh, with preliminary data seems to have helped individuals um, and and you know apart from this the, that smaller six person study if you want to call that's very small more of a case series um, that uh, that there are a lot of people that are doing this and have and have been healing their SIBO so uh, yes potentially you could help all of those things it doesn't matter what causes all, all cause all these things in the first place and you might need a bit of help because once you get you know, sometimes the horse is out of the barn, you know, and you've got to, you've got to deal with that situation where it is and you might need a bit more help. Sabine, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Um, I have a question here from uh, the Instagram side of things. Do you recommend magnesium supplements? Uh, only if people need them, you know, generally when people are on a long-term carnivore diet, they don't need magnesium. There are a lot of areas that magnesium has just been stripped out of the soil by this aggressive uh, farming. And so it's not, it's not as plentiful or um, the areas just don't have as much anyway. That's my understanding here in Australia is that the, the land is just a bit uh, deficient in magnesium. And so a lot of people in Australia, for that or other reasons are deficient in, in magnesium and zinc and sometimes selenium. And so if you're going to do a carnivore diet, that will make up for that. And the people that I see on a long-term carnivore diet end up being in good ranges, good or to optimal ranges of magnesium and zinc and selenium. And so they may not need that. But if you're, if you're coming from a deficient state, then it's it could be beneficial to just take a bit of a supplement and bump you up, but eventually you'll get there. And uh, on a carnivore diet, um, you should be able to anyway, especially if you're having uh, you know, a bit of organs and things like that, because they're very, they're very nutrient dense and that can help catch you up. Most people will be able to just maintain on, or catch up and maintain on just muscle meat. Some people uh, may have absorption issues. They may have other sorts of you know, demands that they need just a bit more of these things and that's totally fine they can they can have a bit of uh, a bit of these organs you know try to keep it in proportion to the animal though and remember there's a big buffalo there's one liver right so try, try to keep that in proportion but you know the meat that we're eating isn't the same as the wild meat right the micronutrients that exist in store-bought meat uh, are less than that of grass-fed finished or generally raised animals or wild animals most people do just fine on the store-bought meat. However, it may be that some people need a bit, a bit more, and uh, that's that's where organs come in. They're extremely nutrient dense. You just want to keep it in proportion. You don't want to get it out of proportion because some of these things, especially the metals and the 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 fat soluble vitamins, they can cause a problem when they build up. So long term you don't need a you generally don't need a magnesium supplement or any supplements on a carnivore diet that's sort of the whole point is that you don't you don't need to take supplements if you're eating your natural diet and so you know as you get closer and closer to that eating wild animals with a bit of organs here and there you really shouldn't need um any supplements unless you have a, a specific condition that you can't absorb like pernicious anemia and you just aren't able to absorb b12 because you had an autoimmune attack to your stomach and you can't make intrinsic factor that sort of thing um but no most people don't need to take any supplements uh except maybe early on if you're very deficient in these sorts of things taking a bit of supplements to just sort of catch you up quicker you know i'm not opposed to that um and i have recommended that to patients before but in general you don't need to um, you will catch up. You, it'll just take longer if you don't supplement from a deficient state, but you'll get there eventually. Um, but if you're sort of feeling a bit rubbish, 
that'll catch you up. And then you just take that for a couple of months. It can take, especially with magnesium, it can take a while for you to build up those levels. And then you stop. Then you can just maintain that with a, with a carnivore diet. But, but again, that's just if you want to speed things along. Most people don't need to do that. Or, or you don't have to do that. Eventually, you'll get there either way. Okay, so question from Ari Valkor. Um, is it possible to heal or close up murmurs in the heart through carnivore? I have recently been told that surgery is the only way to close the murmurs. Thank you for all you provide. Well, it just depends because there's different causes of murmurs. A murmur is just when the valve doesn't close properly or open properly. Um, there's just a problem with that opening and closing proper, uh, process. And so maybe it'll close, but then it'll push in. It won't hold, you know, hold the flood back, the tide back, and then it pushes back and you get regurgitation. Or it doesn't open all the way. It doesn't open like that. So it just opens part way and it's a stenosis and it, it makes a turbulent flow as it's pushing through there and so what a murmur is is just turbulence you're listening to sound of a bit of, of turbulence through the valves either going forward or regurgitating back um and so that's those the generally the most common kinds of murmurs anyway and so it, it depends you know if you have if you have a bad stenosis because you have a whole, whole bunch of built up calcium and scarring and uh, infection or endocarditis or something like that, that, uh, you know, might not heal, you know, probably won't. Um, I don't have any data on that. I haven't, um, I haven't even looked up if like ketogenic diets or things like that have been improved, uh, have improved murmurs, but it would depend, certainly depend on the type of murmur that that was being caused if it's if it's you know regurgitation where the the valve is a bit loose and weak and it sort of you know doesn't stop the backflow you know it could be that this strengthens things up but you know it, it's just one of those things you sort of have to have to see for yourself i think that for a lot of the murmurs it probably won't but you never know with some of these things it might get better i mean we're we're it's still early days on how many of these things can be helped and and you know the problem is we've said all these different sorts of problems that we haven't really seen too much in the past that are just very common now and how much of these things are coming from our food supply probably the majority but certainly from our environment because 40 years ago they did not exist in the numbers that we're seeing now and uh and yes we did keep very accurate statistics and so people would say oh we just didn't notice it is dumb so um, you know, it, it, we're still waiting to see all the different things that this can improve. So look, it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to make your murmur worse by any stretch of the imagination. It will make your health better in most regards. And it could very well help this, but it's sort of one of those things you have to sort of wait and see because I, I don't have any actual data on that. Um, many causes of murmur probably won't, but it will make you much healthier in general. And, you know, let's see what it does with the murmur. Sabine, um, who had a super chat earlier, thank you very much, um, says, I eat uh, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs and have a lot of butter on the side. Uh, still, I'm constipated. When I go number two, it is rabbit style. What should I do? Can't possibly eat more fat. Um, have about one stick of butter a day. Um, thank you in advance. So that's... That's what you got to do, though. <laughs> it's, um, you know, at a, at a certain point when you you eat a certain amount of fat, you will get diarrhea, right? You won't be able to absorb it and it will come out in dramatic fashion because your body has a limited capacity to absorb fat. And when you exceed that, that excess fat just goes out in your stools. And, and that's what I believe keeps things soft. Um, that seems to fit the observed phenomena anyway. And so... If you're getting constipated, sort of, sort of like the rabbit pellets, that means it's very constipated. That means you're just absorbing every ounce of fat. Now, if you're doing something like taking ox bile, which some people do, I would recommend not doing that, stopping that immediately, because that's going to force you to absorb a lot more fat than your body actually wants to. And so that's not what you want to do. You want to, you want to absorb 
the amount of fat that your body wants you to absorb if you are not there yet or if you're not doing uh, uh ox bile or anything like that then it's just your body wants more fat and so i know that it's i know that it's uh, i know that it's um pretty wild that um that uh, it, it, it's a lot more fat than you're used to. It's a lot more fat than most people are used to. But if you're constipated like that, then by definition, you're not eating enough fat. Your body's absorbing every ounce of fat that is coming in and, and none is coming out. And so your body's like, yes, all of this, need this, all of this. And so even though it's a lot more fat than you've ever eaten in your entire life, I appreciate that, but it's still not enough. And so um, just try to you know, just add in a little bit more butter and everything like that. The beef that you have, just try to make it a bit more uh, fattier cuts if you can. Um, eggs, you could focus on the egg yolks as opposed to egg whites. When you do egg yolks, that's going to be a higher fat concentration. So it's going to have, have about two grams of fat for every one gram of protein. Whereas if it's with the egg white, then it's a little more than one gram of protein to one gram of fat. And so, you know, that's, that's going to tip things, tip things around. And when you, you cook, you cook with butter and you put butter on your steaks and you eat fatty bacon and all that sort of stuff. If you're having cheese or dairy, that can be constipated as well. And um, you even, it can even slow down things from, from the fat. So even though it, it can replace out uh, fat that you're eating as well and you feel full and you don't want to have any more. So be what people can can get um, more more constipated by by adding in dairy as well. So if you're having any dairy, I would cut that out. I would try to increase the fat as well because eventually it will go soft, and eventually, eventually it'll go runny. And so you just want to get it to the soft side and not the runny side, or at least the comfortable side. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, that's that's pretty much what you do. You just try to eat more fat. If you're not able to, to get more fat at the moment and you, and you have to just sort of work on that and build it up, you can try taking a stool softener or something like that in the interim. Uh, but eventually, what you the, the solution is to eat more fat. So good luck with that. I'm sure you'll be able to get there. It's just it is weird at first when you're eating a lot more fat than our bodies are used to. Uh, but you'll get there. Like You'll end up really appreciating the fat and enjoying it and feeling better when you have it. So, uh, Adam, uh, thank you very, very much for the super chat, Adam M. Down 110 pounds. Well, that's awesome. Fantastic, man. I'm on blood pressure medication. Losartan and my readings at home have been around uh, 110, 111, 112, with pulse usually in the low 60s or 50s. What's a good range to bring? Uh, what's a good range to bring up uh, getting off meds? Well, I mean, you could potentially do it now. The thing is, is that uh, it depends on a lot of factors. So, you know, it's important to work with your doctor. Um, if you are getting lightheaded ever, uh, especially when you're standing from sitting and you're just really, oh, a little dizzy, you know, well, most people get, have at one point gotten a head rush when we stood up too fast and uh, had to sort of hold on to the wall and give ourselves a second. Um, if you're getting that uh, regularly, uh, then that's a, that's a sign that your blood pressure medication is too strong and that you're you're dropping your blood pressure and your body is not able to really compensate for it as quickly as it should when you're standing from sitting or lying down so if you're getting that then that's certainly time to talk to your doctor about that if you're not and you just feel fine you could talk to your doctor about reducing the dose and seeing what happens um, and uh, just remember that when you come off medications you tend to have a rebounding effect your blood pressure will go up a bit higher than it would sort of otherwise um, but then that settles down so just understand that it can it can sort of take take a little while before that sort of settles so it's like it's not just like the next day so oh my god it's up at 140 150 back on the meds if it's up at like 180 200 back on the meds but um uh you know but that that is uh unlikely to happen if you come off in a stepwise progression with your doctor so um you know you could you could potentially start looking to wean off these things now if you're uh, not having dizzy spells, if you are having those sort of dizzy, lightheaded spells, probably a good idea to talk to your doctor about that. But just, you know, 
you know, just talk to your doctor to see about it. Just say, hey, look, my blood pressure is getting better. I feel better. You know, is it, you know, can we try weaning off this stuff, you know, and see see what your doctor says. Um, most of the time, they'll, they'll be happy to work with you and um, you say, hey, I changed my diet. I've lost weight. You know, do I need to be on these blood pressure medications? I'd like to start coming off and uh, hopefully they'll they'll be able to help you with that. Question from Lena. Thank you very much for the super chat. Is fat or protein more important? I have trouble sleeping on carnivore. Any tips? Also, are fruit and honey still bad even though it's different sugar? Well, the thing, the problem is it's not different sugar. It's exactly the same kind of sugar. It's, it's fructose and sucrose, and actually honey has quite a lot of fructose. And so that, that's the point. That, I mean, the idea is, is that it's, it is the same sugar. It's just that it comes with other things that are beneficial. But that's the same thing as, as, as saying that spinach has you know, these different vitamins and minerals and there are good things. And so that offsets the bad things that are in there. It doesn't, you know, it's, it's not, it's not um, good enough to make up for the, the stuff that's, that's harmful in it, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, I would, I don't have anything to do with fruit and honey. I have a video just called fruit and honey are not carnivore. And I sort of go through all that, um, fruit, you know, it's, yeah, you know, the, the plant wants something to eat the fruit, but it doesn't necessarily want you to eat the fruit. It wants an animal that it's co-evolved with to eat the fruit and pass its seeds around. But a lot of these fruits and berries co-evolve with birds and most, most fruit and berry on earth will kill you. And if you get, if you're out in the woods and you see these little bulbs and berries and things like that, that you don't recognize, bad idea to eat them because they will likely kill you. And, you know, that was, that was a traditional sort of thing when you're out in the woods, you never eat red berries. You just don't eat random red berries that you don't see because that, that's a warning. This is a red, like, don't eat me. I'll kill you sort of thing or to attract birds and things like that. So anyway, it's, um, it's not a good idea to uh, eat random fruit or berries. And even though the plant wants something to eat it, it doesn't want you to eat it. So still the majority of fruit will kill you. The cassowary bird eats about 150 different types of fruit in the tropics. And, oh, these are tropical fruits. So tropical fruits are all great. No, they're not. Every single one of those fruits will kill you. Every single one of those fruits will kill anything except the cassowary bird. Because if those seeds don't go through the gut of a cassowary bird, they don't turn into a plant. They don't germinate. And so if a cassowary bird leaves that area, those, those plants die out. So it has to be very attractive to a cassowary bird and very detrimental to anything else trying to eat it. And so, you know, it is not the case that even the fruit that we eat, even the sweet fruit, don't have any toxins. They do. And they have a lot more toxins when they're not ripe because the seeds aren't ready yet. The problem is we don't pick these things right. If you, if you picked them ripe in your own yard, you had an avocado tree or something like that, it's going to be better than, than what it would be if you buy from the store. But if you buy from the store, they pick these things green. And the plant has to take out the toxins. We've seen this in studies with tomatoes. That you pick them green, they don't actually detoxify. It's not like they just break down in the fruit into harmless by, uh, byproducts, right? They, they retain all of those. It's the vine ripened ones that have less toxins in them because the plant is pulling out those toxins. But if you pick it early when the seeds aren't ready, that has, still has all of its defenses intact. Good luck buying a fruit from the store that has not been picked green, right? Because that's just how they travel. I mean, some of these, some of these apples, you, know, the, you eat an apple today, it's an apple that was picked a year ago and it was picked green, you know? So that's, yeah. but it's, it is the same kind of sugar. It's fructose and glucose and that's not what you want. You know, you, you, you get, you have four grams of glucose throughout your entire bloodstream at any given time. That's just a level teaspoon of glucose one more gram up to five grams that's a toxic dose of glucose in your body and it, your body reacts to it as a toxin by trying to detoxify it by raising your insulin trying to get that below four grams and if it maintains above four grams and you have diabetes basically not basically literally then that's when people start dying and getting multi-organ failure and getting their limbs hacked off and kidneys failing and dying right? It's because of that one extra gram of glucose. So we're 
throwing in hundreds of extra grams of glucose and fructose and, and galactose and all these sorts of things, that's, that's harming you. And your body can compensate for that for a while, but not forever. And so that's not something that, that uh, you want to do. And certainly not something that I want to do. Uh, what's more important, fat or protein? Both. They're both important. You need enough fat. You need enough protein. So it's not that you want one or the other. They are both essential nutrients. They're essential amino acids that you have to have. And even the so-called non-essential amino acids, you do better with more of them, like taurine and carnitine. And um, the fats are essential fats. There are essential fatty acids that you have to have or you get sick and you die or you don't develop properly. Your brain doesn't work properly. Your body doesn't work properly. And there are essential fat-soluble nutrients that come along with the fat that you have to have or you get sick and you may die and you have all these sorts of other problems that you, you could get in, in development and, uh, and beyond. So it's, it's not just one or the other. It's not, they're not just calorie sources. That's something that we just need to throw out because a lot of these things are being used as structural materials are being used as precursor to other chemicals, hormones, and uh, proteins that we make in our body. Everything that our DNA codes for is a protein, right? And so that's a stack and chain of amino acids in this line of line, and then they fold and flip around, and then you have a folded up protein molecule that goes around and does work in the cell and in the body. That's not being used to uh, to to as a, as a fuel source that's a building block and material so it doesn't matter how much energy is released when you burn it because it's not being burned in the first place because we're not combustion engines we're chemical factories and we break bonds to create chemical energy and make atp and then break those bonds to um, uh, facilitate other chemical interactions so that's just completely i mean that's like that's like saying like, how much does left weigh like you're, you're using the wrong units that makes no sense in this context right and so and um you know what temperature is sideways like no this is just like what's wrong with you this is completely unrelated and so um you don't look at it like that you need fat animal fat you need protein animal protein um, because there are things like carnitine and, uh, that uh, don't exist in plants and that actually only 70% of people make enough of it. And so 30% of people do need carnitine from their diet. It is an essential amino acid for 30% of people, third of the population, right? And everyone does better with more of it. So you just need enough. You eat about one gram of fat to one gram of protein, up to two grams of fat, to one gram of protein or thereabouts and you just see what your body needs you're, again your body only has a limited capacity to absorb fat you just eat as much fat as you as you're able to and you check your stools and if you're getting constipation you're not eating enough if you're getting diarrhea you may be eating too much unless you're confounding it by still eating other things i mean whenever i say any of these things i am talking about in the context of someone only eating meat and only drinking water nothing else goes in your mouth that you swallow that you swallow that you know is is outside of those two things right so if you're taking a sports drink or you're taking a pre-workout or you're taking supplements that have sweeteners or you're taking electrolytes that have sweeteners you're out you know that's not you don't qualify for what i'm talking about i'm talking about only meat only water right if you're doing that and you're getting diarrhea it could be that you're eating more fat than than your body can absorb it's likely it is or you're so constipated that you're getting overflow diarrhea and you're getting watery stools and then every now and then you get this boulder that comes out and then you're back to the watery stools and that means you need a lot more fat but if you are drinking coffee tea non-sugar sweeteners magnesium supplements metformin other medications those can all cause uh they can all have a laxative effect and so it may to cover that up and so you may have loose stools, but you may be taking metformin and magnesium and drinking coffee. Like, well, you probably will have loose stools on a carnivore diet. You don't have a whole bunch of fiber jamming up the works. So if you're only eating meat, only drinking water, which I recommend to everybody, then you keep eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good. Make sure your stools are soft. And then you just eat to your body's demand. It will change. But the thing is, is that you don't need to figure that out. Your body will figure that out for you. If you're only eating what you're supposed to eat, your body will be able to tell you and you'll be able to listen to it. And so you eat until it stops taking.
tasting good. That's very key. And um, because you, you'll feel like, oh, I feel satisfied. I feel like I could stop. That's not when you stop on a carnivore diet. That's when you stop on a traditional diet, when you can't trust your hormones, when you can't trust your signals, when you're just like, oh, I should stop. Because if I, if I keep going, I'm going to get fat. You don't do that in the carnivore diet. You keep eating until fatty meat stops tasting good because if it still tastes good, your body's telling you that it still wants those nutrients. And then eventually, it, it but it tastes less good and less good and less good until eventually it doesn't taste good at all. And that's when you stop. You take a bite and say, hmm, didn't really enjoy that. Stop. You just naturally stop. That's how animals in the wild naturally stop. At least that's what I've sort of come to, come to realize. Sugar is an outlier. You can have these uh, evolutionary traps, they're called, where you have something like a hummingbird that sees something a little red, little shaped object, and they'll go in, ooh, that's a flower, I'm going to go get nectar. And um, in the Midwest, they have these, these little uh, wire, electric wire ties that sort of were nearly that sort of shape and color. And so the little hummingbirds would go in, stick their little beak in to try to get the nectar, and they'd hit the live wire and they'd die, right? And so they had to change the color of these things because they were just every every time when they were red, there's and they just they were just dropping like flies, unfortunately. So that's an evolutionary trap. There's there's signals in them saying, hey, go get this. So food scientists have uh, taken advantage of those evolutionary traps in humans to make things highly palatable and say, oh, we should get this. We should eat this. Eat more. 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 Sugar is an evolutionary trap. We did not find this in great abundance uh, historically. But we, 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 you know, it seems that fructose is the sweetest of the of the carbohydrates because there aren't any plants that are that are acutely poisonous to humans that are deadly to humans that day that contain fructose. But fructose itself, with long term exposure at high levels, will cause harm. And so, you know, it tastes good. We go, oh, that's safe. I can get energy and I can survive. You know, we get that signal, but, you know, we're getting little crab apples, maybe a bit of honey every now and then. And we're like, oh, that's amazing. Okay, we should get this. But now we've refined it. We put it in everything. And so we hit that evolutionary trap. And so it just tastes good. Like, oh, I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. Because we're, we're never going to find it in that abundance in the wild. You're just not going to. And uh, it's certainly not every day. So that's hitting an evolutionary trap. Meat is not an evolutionary trap. It does not make you want to do more and more and more until you hurt yourself. That's actual normal, normal biology. And so you eat until it stops tasting good. That's how you figure that out. So that's what you do. You aim for about one to two grams of fat for every one gram of protein. You eat that fatty meat until it stops tasting good. And two to one fat to protein is about 65% lean ground beef with 35% fat. That's what that works out to be. So a lot thrown at you, but uh, it actually is fairly straightforward when you sort of break it down. Joseph, thank you very much for the super chat. What do you feed your cat and how many times a day do they eat? Meat. That's the only thing that cat has ever eaten is meat, raw meat. You don't feed cats cooked meat. Um, I mean, you can occasionally, but it doesn't have all the all the nutrients they need. It's better, things like taurine can get uh, denatured when you when you cook them and so they need um, they need raw meat and uh, there are experiments people should look up called Pottinger's cats it's a very interesting story on that on YouTube uh, about how they just had fed one group of cats raw meat and they were perfectly healthy and generation after generation one still meat but just cooked meat and they weren't as healthy and every generation got smaller and smaller and smaller brains and worse bone structures in the face and the smaller cheekbones and worse bone mineralization and uh, you know less interested in mating and had more health issues and all these sorts of things. And then the third generation are very sickly, very poor bone density. They had the they said the bones were like made out of foam rubber. It was really sad. And you know, one little kitten had like 30 fractures. It was very, very sad. And they couldn't reproduce it after that third generation. They couldn't do it weren't really interested in it. And then anytime there was a t an attempt, they didn't get pregnant. And a few times they did get pregnant, they had stillbirths. And so um, it's, uh, it's, uh, is, is they're, they're missing out. And this sort of just, it just adds up. And eventually they just can't, can't hack it anymore. They switch it back over to raw meat and cats got healthier. 
they were able to reproduce the next generation they weren't back to the the raw the raw cat group it took four generations to breed back to the raw cat size stature and health so there's a lot of epi multi-generational knock-on effects and epigenetic effects which is which is pretty interesting actually um from a genetic points of view genetics point of view uh but you feed cats raw meat that's what you do oh you don't feed them raw chicken why the hell not yeah <laughs> you know, cats eat uh uh raw birds all the time in the in you know outside so uh you just feed them raw meat and uh that's the only thing that he's had he's very very healthy very active happy little boy still sort of acts like a kitten jumping around attacking things which i think is awesome and uh, yeah and so that's that's what we do when we feed the dogs that too um generally feed them about once a day but you know big bowl of raw meat we might feed him more often like that that kid is a hunter like he's a, anytime we're eating meat or steak like he wants in on it you know he wants in on the kill so even if he's eaten that day so uh, and the dogs too we just give them meat um you know sometimes we'll give them little scraps of like cooked meat and stuff like that but mostly what they get is raw meat and um for both the dogs and the cats Stephen Frank Films, uh, thank you for Super Chat. Just says, thanks, Doc. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Cordelia, thank you for the Super Chat. Do you think the carnivore diet will actually heal the retinal hemorrhage, hemorrhage in my left eye? Depends on what caused it. Um, retinal hemorrhages can be caused by uh, glycation damage, the high blood sugar and fructose, I believe, is, can directly damage the retina. There are ophthalmologists such as uh, my friend uh, dr chris kenobi and others who have uh, found that many ophthalmological conditions can be fixed through dietary interventions and just going towards more meat and less of this processed garbage and sugar and seed oils and all these sorts of things uh, even before you get to a full carnivore diet um, but you know ketogenic diets and and um, and uh, just getting rid of garbage does seem to help and um, I, I know several ophthalmologists that put their patients on keto and carnivore specifically diets. And so it depends on what's causing a retinal hemorrhage, but carnivore diet can at least remove a lot of the harmful agents that can damage your retina. Yes. So hopefully it does uh, fix your particular issue. But even if it doesn't help with that, because there are other other causes of things going wrong in our body than just the food that we're eating but um uh, it'll help you in many other ways anyway so it'll help you get a lot better in a lot of other ways so good luck with that and i hope hopefully it helps with that uh, either way it'll help you in a lot of other ways and you'll feel great classic thank you for the super chat hey fever slash season or allergies are they triggered by the gut good question you know a lot of things are being discovered to be sort of triggered by the gut. I don't, I don't know that those are though. I do know that my allergies have certainly gotten a hell of a lot better since I stopped eating just broccoli and spinach and bloody kale. I don't know why I ever ate that stuff. It looks like something a brontosaurus would eat. You know, stuff is just prehistoric, but um, uh, my allergies certainly got better. It could be that you're just oversensitizing your immune system is to start acting in a deranged fashion and you just get you just get a bit overworked but you know you can still sneeze you can still get reactions to things um it's just mine are certainly less and my asthma is way different than it, than it was just by dropping the greens right so that was that was big for me i don't know if they're, they're they can be triggered by the gut that's a good question but um it's uh it's not something that i that i know too much about so um sorry i couldn't answer that specifically bishop's deep learning thank you so much for the super chat does bowel production increase in response to increased fat intake i'm noticing i can consume more fat without getting diarrhea the longer i stay on carnivore uh probably that but you know we, we don't know for sure i mean we but your body's very efficient you know if you're if you're just not eating if you're just under eating fat for just decades and decades and decades you know bile is an expensive resource it doesn't just make it just for fun right and so it could be that you know if you're just not getting enough fat your body's just like okay well we're just not gonna we're just not gonna waste resources on this 
um, and it can cause problems, obviously, because you keep concentrating this stuff, you'll form gallstones. And uh, because any hyper concentrated solution at rest will form crystals and precipitate. And that's what that's what gallstones are. That's what bile sludge is. And that's what the gall, gall bladder does is it concentrates bile. Right. And, um, you know, physiology textbooks will say it can go up to 20 times as uh, concentrated. Maybe some people concentrate it even more. Maybe those are the ones that are predisposed to getting um, bile uh, gallstones. But whatever reason, you know, um, that they get gallstones and others don't. If you just eat as much fat as your body is making bile for, you, you cannot get gallstones. You can't because there won't be any bile in your gallbladder anyway to form a stone. Doesn't matter. And so I, I, I have noticed that phenomenon as well, that people eating the exact same amount, you know, for a few weeks and they're getting diarrhea, just copious diarrhea. Now, often these guys are drinking coffee still or tea and uh, or using non-sugar sweeteners usually in the coffee or tea and so that's a bit of a fly in the ointment but um uh, oftentimes we'll have sort of diarrhea early on and then it just normalizes and that could be that phenomenon where you're making more bile and you're absorbing more fat so i think it's, it's, it's quite possible and i think if you're eating more fat and you're and you're tolerating it and your body's actually wanting it that probably is what's happening but um don't have don't have any proof one way or the other, but I mean, that's that's just the observation. That's a sort of a naturalistic observation of, of what's happening. And so that's very likely the case. Steve Lars um, has a question, it says, I'm wondering about potassium on carnivore on day 52 of beef eggs only. Uh, well, if you're on fit day 52 and your heart hasn't stopped, then you're getting enough potassium. Pretty simple. Right. So, uh, yes, you get everything you need. You get everything you need in the proportion that you need it from meat, because by definition, uh, you would have to. If that's something that we that we're biologically designed for. And it turns out that it is. And so um, you don't you, you know, we need different amounts of nutrients when we eat different things, because, you know, different different plants have anti nutrients that block out the absorption and utilization of different nutrients and they can actually strip out different nutrients out of your your bloodstream and body and some people may have disruptions in their electrolytes early on when they're when their insulin is coming back down to normal levels but not everybody um, if you're in that group and you're feeling a bit rotten and getting sort of keto flu -y sort of things or what used to be called the atkins flu or the carnivore flu now all these sorts of things not everybody gets that but sometimes that can be from an electrolyte imbalance, and maybe that can help. Um, if you're past that and you feel great, great. Um, I, have, I have yet to see somebody uh, in my clinic that has had uh, low potassium when going on a carnivore diet. I've seen one guy that I did a consult with after several months, and he had normal potassium all the way, and then it blipped down just slightly. And then I said, okay, well, you have no symptoms of it. You normally get... Um, you can, if it gets too low, you're, you can, you can trigger atrial fibrillation and then ventricular fibrillation and then you die. And so it's, it's actually quite serious. Um, which is why, you know, this is not something that it was, oh, I have leg cramps must be potassium. Probably not actually, you know, it's uh, when you have truly low potassium, you get heart arrhythmias and if you get truly low sodium, you get. Uh, cognitive issues and um, and consciousness issues. So you you will be very hard to rouse. You'll just be sleeping all the time. You wake up and you just go back to sleep, uh, or you go into a coma and you die. So these these are very important to keep it at optimal levels, which is why your body does that for you. And so uh, I that that one gentleman that had very slightly low. I mean, just just on the just on the wrong side of the line that we draw fairly, um, you know, could, you know, arbitrarily, I mean, is it, is it, is it, is 3.5 fine and then 3.4, oh my God, that's a disaster. I mean, no, I mean, they're, they're still pretty damn close and you generally won't get symptomatic if it's 3.4, but you, you know, potentially could. Um, and so he was, he was down sort of at that. He was just sort of like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 down on his potassium and uh completely asymptomatic and i just said look just just test it again could be an outlier could have been a lab error 
and um, you know, and it could be just a blip for whatever reason. Checked it again, perfectly formed in the middle of the range. Great. So that's not a problem. Um, you know, if you're doing fine, you don't have symptoms, you don't have to worry about it. If you're getting you know, racing heartbeat in your regular pattern to your racing heartbeat that could be in your regular pattern like atrial fibrillation, definitely get that checked out. Definitely go to the doctor, get an EKG, ECG, and get your, your electrolytes checked. I, I really haven't seen people have to do that, you know, if, but if you do, if you, I mean, some people get, get uh, what they would call palpitations because it's a very hard, strong, heavy heartbeat. And, but it's not over 100 beats per minute. It's not an irregular pattern. That's more likely to be that your heart's now running on ketones, which is its preferred fuel source. And now you're just running on rocket fuel instead of your know, crude oil. And your heart's going, yes, this is it. And so it's like beating very hard. And that happened to me. It was very strange. But, you know, I sort of looked at it and I'm like, oh, that's a bit alarming. But I, cause I could hear it in my ear. I was just like trying to see. There's just, dum, 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 dum. you know, it's just like very loud. And um, and so I was counting. And I was just like, okay, well, it's a, it's a normal rate. It's a normal rhythm. There's no pattern. I'm like, okay, this is fine. It's just my heart beating hard for some damn reason. Okay, my blood pressure is normal, my rate's normal, my rhythm's normal. I'm not going to worry about it. A couple weeks later, went away. And so um, it doesn't even sound like you're having that. So if you're not having any issues with your heart, I wouldn't worry about it. If you get racing heartbeat over 100 beats per minute sustained at rest, or you're getting a regular pattern, then yes, definitely go see the doctor and get that checked out and, and check your potassium at the time. Uh, that's, that's definitely important to do. I haven't really seen that be a necessity, uh, though, in, in that pattern. I haven't really seen anybody get atrial fibrillation from from low potassium, or just low potassium, or just you know atrial fibrillation come out of nowhere. So, um, I think you're fine. If you're worried, just check. Uh, Steve Lawrence, thank you for the for the super sticker. Oh yeah, so a super sticker. Thank you very much. Um, great. I was just gonna see if we have any. Oof, the Instagram side of things, my feed didn't keep up. Um, uh, one from V. Meliaricus. I am sure I destroyed that name. Sorry about that. It says, "Hey, a dermatologist here from Greece. What about vitamin E? Uh, vitamin E is great, but you'll get you'll get everything you need from uh, the fatty meat. You know, vitamin. There's plenty of vitamin E." in uh, animal fats and uh, organs as well so tons of that you'll get plenty in in the in the the meat that you're eating by definition like we'll, you'll get everything you need um in the proportion that you need it when you're eating your evolved diet and that's sort of sort of why you eat your evolved diet okay there we go christina dunn thank you very much for the super chat I'm experiencing histamine issues. I had to stop eating ground beef and eggs. I was going to take DAO to help with the symptoms. Is that okay? I'm not actually sure what DAO is. Um, I don't think you necessarily have to take anything. Um, but you know, the, the main thing is, is that is that if you are having problems, um, if you're having problems with with ground beef or eggs, you you can avoid that. And so, if you're eating other meats and that's okay, then just then just focus on those. So you know you don't want to do anything that gives you a reaction for whatever reason, be it histamines or something else. You just want to you just want to eat the meat that tastes good to you, makes you feel the best, and that you have access to and can afford. So that's that's what you want to do. Um, if you're having problems with um, if you're having problems with the with uh you know ground beef and eggs for for whatever reason then you know just avoid them it may be that that you may not have a an issue with them at a later date but at the moment you do and so you know just just avoid them if you're i mean you're taking some sort of antihistamines or something like that um then you know potentially that that can you know that can be mitigated with with antihistamines like antihistamines could help potentially but um it's uh it's 
and so you can try that you know and if, if you i don't know what dao is i don't know if that's antihistamine but um you can just try you can just try uh whatever you want to see if that helps and if it does great otherwise just just sort of avoid uh, those meat like the, the the ground beef and eggs that you're eating so that's that's my advice it's just we, we don't always know that these are histamines or these are or anything else we just know that we're getting a reaction and for whatever reason we're getting a reaction just go just go somewhere else as long as there's other meat that you can eat that's that's the important thing Herman Rulins, thank you very much for the super chat. Is high fat carnivore suitable for someone with pancreatic cancer? Absolutely. So first of all, it's suitable for everyone. It's suitable for every human. It's suitable for every non-human too, um, because it's it's not bad for anyone. A, a giraffe can eat meat and do so very, very healthfully. And in fact, a lot of uh, large herbivores do opportunistically eat other smaller animals when and where they can and so it's uh it's it's good for everyone it's just nutrients it's nothing bad you know and so like that's the whole point plants have nutrients but they have things that are bad meat has nutrients and no bad um unless you run into like a poison sack or something like that but that's not what we're talking about um so people especially with pancreatic cancer or just cancer in general uh it's very important to be on a proper human diet on a proper biologically appropriate diet where you're eating what you're supposed to eat your body's going to help it's going to help your body work the way it's supposed to work and especially help uh, your body fight uh, the cancer um, there are hundreds of studies showing uh, ketogenic diets ketogenic metabolic therapy is very efficacious in um, in in uh, treating or helping cancer treatments they can work as an adjunct People have also used it as standalone therapy. I would recommend adjunct. I would still recommend listening to your oncologist about chemo and radiation, um, especially for certain kinds of cancer that have a very high success rate with those. Pancreatic cancer is, is often quite resistant. Um, so it certainly isn't going to be a bad idea to, to try other, other sorts of things like ketogenic carnivore diets, specifically ketogenic carnivore diets don't have anything with sugar or or um, sweeteners or carbohydrates it's very important to keep your blood sugar down your ketones up and in a calorie restricted fashion four to one calories from fat to protein that seems to be sort of the magic ratio there or three to one four to one in that range um, that from the human trials and the animal trials, that seems to be the best ratio of fat to protein for ketogenic metabolic therapy, trying to keep that GKI down, which is glucose ketone index. Lower your glucose, higher your ketones, or lower your GKI. You wanna keep that below two or below one if possible. That's therapeutic range is below two. And you do this with a combination of, of carnivore diet and fasting. And this can work as an adjunct too because it, it actually improves outcomes of chemo and radiation that was shown in a study in 2018 2019 and 2018 was on radiation 2019 was on chemo so it sensitizes the cancer cells to the chemo and radiation so they get more damage and it protects your healthy cells from the chemo and radiation so they don't get damaged as damaged they're going to get damaged and so that i think is very important now if the question is pancreatic cancer because the pancreas makes digestive enzymes that are now, and now it's a bit harder for it to do that. And, and should we eat meat because that's gonna put more stress on the pancreas? You need the pancreas to break down all your food. And in fact, it's a lot more difficult to break down non-meat than it is to break down meat. Meat is what we're designed to eat. Meat is what we're designed to break down, digest, and absorb. So that's actually easier for your body to do that. It's gonna be easier in your pancreas as well. And so it's actually uh, even better from that standpoint as well. So. If I ever got cancer, pancreatic or otherwise, I would probably not eat for about 21 days. And then I would go through periods of fasting and carnivore with periods of refeeding, keep my GKI down as low as possible. I, depending on the type of cancer, if it was something that relied more on glucose, that's just what I would do. If it relied more on glutamine, then I would look into the agents that can interrupt glutamine metabolism and stop the 
stop the uh, cancers from, from running on glutamine either. And if it was something that had a high, uh, you know, um, five-year survival rate, cure rate, remission rate with uh, chemo and radiation, I would consider it. And if it's something that uh, did not have a very good uh, rate, I probably would not consider it because I don't want to do a bunch of damage to my body that doesn't actually get me anywhere. So there's a lot of considerations in there, but first and foremost, I would absolutely do uh, um, a very high fat carnivore diet that was ketogenic, get my GKI down low, long periods of fasting, and get that GKI down as low as possible and have periods of refeeding because you don't want to lose too much weight. And um, uh, that's what I would do. And hopefully you or your loved one who has uh, pancreatic cancer uh, does well. Good luck with that. I'm very sorry that they've had to go through that. Unfortunately, cancer is getting more and more and more prevalent as we go. And I think that's that's very you know, speaking to the um, that's speaking to the state of our environment because cancer rates have never been this high ever. And of course we knew about cancer. Oh, we're just screening or well, screening. So we're getting, no, <laughs> if you didn't screen for these things, they would just turn into full blown metastatic cancer that would, that would be terminal. You catch it early. Oh, look, here's a little cancer there. You catch that early, you take it out, you cut it out and it doesn't spread. Oh, well, that means that we're just catching more cancers. No, because we're, ca we're catching them early, so they're not turning into a big metastatic mess at the end at the end of the story, because that is what happens, you know, unless you're saying that these things just spontaneously resolve. You're saying that you have a, you know, five-inch lesion in your, in your lung that's cancerous and spread to your lymph nodes, and that's just going to self-resolve with doing nothing different. Probably not. If you're doing something different, like you go on a ketogenic carnivore diet, you know, then that that's that's shown that people can resolve as standalones. That's in the literature. That's published data. But you know, it's not just going to do it for nothing, right? So you know, cancer rates are, are at an all-time high, and, it's, and they're just going higher every decade. And oh well, screening is just you know, we're just doing more screening. Dumb, dumb statement by dumb people. If you don't catch those early, then you're going to catch them late. Like they're going to come. They're going to come down that pipe, right? And so just because you caught it early doesn't mean that you wouldn't have become metastatic and full-blown later on and you wouldn't have known about it. Like that's that's ridiculous. Um, you know, you would have. You know, I mean, some cancers just sit there sort of like a you know, toad in a well and just sort of just chilling there. You know, like prostate cancer can do that. Uh, or it can metastasize your bones and kill you very quickly, you know. But, um, you know, the thing is, is that uh, cancer rates are going up. And if you catch them early, then you have a better chance of treating them. If you catch them late, you have a less good chance of treating them. But you're going to catch it. It's going to happen. You're going to get a diagnosis at some point. You know, you're going to find out that that person had cancer. So it is just not the case that we're just screening more people. Or the same thing with the heart disease. People saying there's, oh, we're just getting better at screening. That's why the rates are going up. They're going up because more people are having heart attacks, you fool. You know, that's not, that has nothing to do with screening. Um, you know, if you screen someone and then they all causes a heart attack, we'd probably stop screening then. No, more people are having heart attacks or just surviving. So they're saying, oh, well, the age adjusted mortality rate for heart disease peaked in the 60s and 70s, and then it's come down. Oh, and that's, that's so great. That's because of, you know, we've gotten rid of saturated fat and, we're putting people on on medications to lower their cholesterol nonsense you know we've got better interventions we've got better hospital system the ambulance systems we can get people from in remote areas to cath lab more easily and people have stopped smoking massively reduce the amount of smoking so those are all going to reduce mortality rates but the incidence and prevalence is going up decade after decade more people are having their first time heart attack than ever before it's just that they're surviving Right. They're not it's not a death sentence anymore. And so, you know, um, and, and, and again, age adjusted data. Anytime you adjust anything, you're not using the real numbers. So basically just ignore anything that says age adjusted or this adjusted or that adjusted because you're not using the raw data. 
You're not using real data. You're, you're changing it. You're altering it. You're adjusting it. And you're adjusting it to fit, fit your own uh, purposes generally. And um, so, no, the, uh, the rates of heart disease are going up. The rates of cancers are going up. More people are getting cancer. Oh, we're living longer. Bullshit. The average life expectancy from birth has not actually gone up all that much in the last several decades. In fact, now it's starting to go down, you know, and so, you know, this is this is just not the case. And so people are just making excuses after excuses and they're just trying to deny the reality in front of them, either because they're just stubborn and pig headed or it fits their ideology or they're a bastard and they're trying to trick people and uh, and they're under the payroll of, you know, whatever big food, big uh pharma, whatever, that wants to keep perpetuating this disease state. Either way, it's bullshit, and don't listen to it. Aaron, thank you very much for the super chat. Wife has POTS and EDS. I'm assuming that's Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She says, uh, I'm a week on carnivore and feeling nauseous with food aversions. Meat doesn't taste good and makes my stomach turn, but I know I'm hungry. What should I eat? Um, well, just try to eat meat or eggs that taste good to you. If you're getting meat aversions, it is likely that you are not as hungry as you think. Um, just generally at the beginning of the meal, it probably will taste good. It just may, it may be that you're not, that you're, you're eating less than you think you should. You're getting carb cravings, sugar cravings. That's not hunger. That's a craving. That's a, that's a, that's a incorrect signal that you're getting that goes away. That goes away usually after two weeks. And so, you know, just try eating at least once a day, fatty meat. And if it tastes good, great. Keep eating until it stops tasting good. If that's only a little bit in, that's fine. You know, it may be that your body's just telling you, hey, you don't need to eat all that much. And just listen to that. If you're getting cravings, it's, it's just, you know, carb cravings, sugar cravings, these sorts of things that, that do go away. So I would still listen to your body. If your body just says that they just don't eat, probably don't need to eat. If you have excess uh, adipose tissue, then you're probably, uh, you know, your body doesn't need as much energy coming in that it that it would in other circumstances. So just listen to that. Um, but again, well, and also too, you know, some people feel nauseous because they're just not used to eating as much fat as all that. And they're not used to eating as much meat and they're just sort of freaking them out. Um, but if your body's telling you not to eat meat, it's telling you not to eat. It's not telling you not to eat that. It's telling you just not to eat because that is what you're designed to eat. It, it'll go away. Um, just do try to do that. Um, you know, drink water, eat meat, um, eat meat when it tastes good, when and where it tastes good, and stop when it stops tasting good, even if that's a lot less than you think that uh, you would, well, a lot less than you normally have and you think that you need. Just you know, you will get through this. Your body will will talk to you and is talking to you. And so, if it's if it's a certain meat that's doing that, try a different meat. You know, maybe bacon works, maybe eggs work, maybe lamb works, but beef doesn't work. Something like that. Some people have, have these weird sort of things where they just like they're eating lamb for a while and then they and then the body's just like oh, can't do lamb anymore. And but beef tastes great or pork tastes great or something like that. Try different meats. But still listen to your body. If meat stops tasting good, just stop. And um, I would expect that to, to settle down and, and certainly the cravings and uh, and everything go away. Things a lot of times we're just used to eating all the time. And so we don't actually realize that we don't need as much as, as we, we normally ate. We say, oh, I have to eat. I have to eat more. I have to eat more. And um, I eat once a day. You know, I've got, I've got 23 hours of my day just just for me, you know, and that's not what it used to be. You know, it used to be you're just constantly looking for food because you're getting low grade nutrition and you're getting these deranged hunger signals that are telling your body to, to eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Um, and uh, that's not the case anymore. And so when you get your natural signals, you don't need to eat nearly as much or as often because you're eating high density nutrition. And so, um, your weekend, still early days, usually after two weeks, those weird hunger signals will go away. Those carb cravings will go away. Keep listening to your body. Eat fatty meat until it stops tasting good. When it stops tasting good, you're done. 
You know, you can drink water after that. If you're feeling snacky or weird, oh, I should eat, I should eat. Maybe try drinking water. Sometimes that settles that down. If meat's not tasting good, it's not sounding appealing, try water instead. See how that goes. Usually in another week or two, this, this will settle down. And uh, as long as you're eating enough and eating fatty meat until it stops tasting good, you'll be fine. Okay, question from uh, Lena, who says, I had menstrual cycle before starting carnivore when I did animal based, but now that I switched my cycle, um, now that I've switched my cycle has been late for two weeks, how can I fix? Um, so the thing is, is that is that obviously this is very hormonally based. And so sometimes when you go on a carnivore diet, when you go on a carnivore diet, you cut out carbs, you cut out sugar, and you cut out all these other sorts of things that will disrupt your normal hormonal pathways in your, and, and production and utilization that you can get disruption in your, in your period. Um, you know, so that, that can happen. And so in, in women that that does disrupt their, their cycle, it generally lasts a couple months, sometimes three to four months, four or five months. That's sort of the outside that I've seen. And then it, and then it is, it, it fits into a more normal pattern. So it may take a couple of months before this, this sort of settles down. I mean, if your cycle has been late for two weeks, is there a possibility that you're pregnant? You know, that's obviously always on the cards. Hopefully that didn't freak you out, but it's something that you should consider. And if that's a possibility, get that checked as well, because that's obviously part of it, uh, part of the equation. But if um, if uh, it's not that, then it's likely just your hormones are being, you know, are, are changing and adjusting and fixing and optimizing. And then that can change your cycle and that can happen. And uh, that's actually quite common for women that it, it changes their pattern of their cycle but then after a few months that settles down and just uh goes pretty well after that uh the dude thank you very much for the super chat not seeing a question attached but maybe there's one down the line um i'm not really seeing one but i'll keep an eye out for it vladimir thank you very much for the super chat Thanks for all you're doing, man. Uh, because of you, I'm Carnival for Life. Well, awesome. I, I appreciate that. You're very welcome. I'm glad that that's helped, and uh, you know, good luck with it. Joanna Hunter, thank you for the super chat. Five months on Carnivore and recently having episodes of belching, I'm thinking belching, and a little heartburn. Um, am I dumping oxalates? Any recommendation? Well, the, the thing with oxalate dumping is that it can be very vague. It can sort of manifest as anything. I haven't heard it really be belching, but maybe. You know, I mean, the thing with oxalates, they almost, they almost do anything. Um, and a little heartburn. Um, I, I would, that wouldn't be my first guess. You know, I, I think that it would, it would probably more likely be something else. One of the things to, to do is to try to get a, um, like a, like a journal, like a food and symptom journal. We just write down what you ate and what time you ate it every day and when you got symptoms, what your symptoms were and, uh, and see if there's any sort of correlation. Sometimes it can be that you're eating certain things and that's just sort of disagreeing with you. Maybe there's something in like that you're not really handling chicken or pork or eggs or something like that. And your body's just sort of reacting a bit negatively to that. And, um, uh, or it could be completely unrelated. And at least then you have information. You can find a relationship. Maybe you uh, get away from you know whatever was was uh, associated with that. Maybe that helps it. Or maybe you find there's absolutely no association whatsoever. And then you sort of look at, at uh, other sort of causes. But that's that's what I would do. Um, oxalate dumping will quite typically come with different sorts of things like you know, rashes, you know, weird stuff white crystals coming out of your eyes or your skin or uh, joint pains and uh, gout-like symptoms. You know, oxalates can cause gout. And that's, the, that's one, of the, one of the causes of gout um, is oxalates. And um, I think that was the, the, it's called pseudo-gout. But previously, there were five causes of gout and oxalates being one of them. And now, now gout is, is, um, ter is the term for uh, uric acid crystals in the in the joints 
And then the other causes are pseudo gout. So in any case, it can cause gout like symptoms and those sorts of things. But um, I hadn't heard it with belching and a bit of heartburn. I mean, maybe, you know, but it wouldn't be my first go to. I think that that in this case would be a process of, of, of elimination and that the oxalate sort of thing would be a diagnosis of exclusion. If you can't find anything else, you know, maybe consider oxalates in this case and uh, you know have you know very low amount of oxalate like a little bit of lemon juice or something in water i believe that'll do it or just like a bit of tea that will have a bit of oxalates in it and see if that helps and if it does then great you know have that for a couple weeks and then try coming off of it and see what happens and uh, see how you go but i would start with the diary first and see see what that does for you verge thank you very much for the super chat Big fan, eight months in and loving it. Just curious, have you been um, have you been more immune to say common colds since you've been 100% carnivore? And if you still get them, do you experience them differently to pre carnivore life? Absolutely. So my immune system is is way better now. I I don't get um, I don't get the you know the um, well I don't I just don't get sick as often and uh, nearly as often and um and uh and when i do get sick it's, it's more i just feel a bit more tired and a bit run down i'm not getting like the body aches and feeling you know pretty rubbish and things like that so it's um it's 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 much it's much more subtle i don't i used to get sick like every month like every month i would get a cold and uh that sucks especially because you know you're playing rugby in winter sport in the winter months and you're just sick all the time just sick all the time and um you know because of my asthma if like if i if that sort of went into my lungs i would you know i would get pneumonia quite regularly so i get pneumonia sometimes once sometimes three times a year confirmed diagnosed on x-ray on chest x-ray not good not what i want and so you know i would uh i would just be sick all the bloody time I've really not been sick since I went full carnivore again. In my early 20s, I was just never sick. And I remember like in my teenage years, I was just sick all the time. My friends would always laugh at it. And, you know, when I was uh, when I was doing carnivore in my early 20s, and they were like, oh, yeah, you're just sick all the time. I was, just, like, I was getting a bit fed. I was like, I don't get sick anymore. Like, I, that's not a thing. I don't get sick. And now looking back on it, that was that period of time. I was just never sick. And then again, after that, I started getting sick all the time. And now I just don't get sick. And if I do get sick, it's I'm more tired and run down. I don't even feel sick. It's just I notice there are a lot of other people around me that have flus, and it's like, ooh, okay, I guess that's what that's why I'm feeling a bit tired and run down, or I feel like I'm just maybe fighting something off, and then I go to sleep and wake up fine the next day. So yeah, no, it's very different. My immune system is far better than it was before, and um, yeah, it's it's much much different, very different. Abdi Karani, thank you very much for the super chat. Is there any issue consuming diet Sprite and gum? Uh, yeah, I mean, it does have a lot of chemicals in it that you don't want. I mean, just remember that you know we're not combustion engines. It's not about calories. It's not about burning things and getting energy from burning them because we don't do that. We're chemical factories. We put chemicals in and on our body, and we're going to get chemical reactions. And so that diet Sprite and that gum, uh, you know, the, the non-sugar sweeteners that are in there, they will have chemical interactions in your body. And even though they're not going to have the same chemical interactions as, as sugar, they're still going to have chemical interactions. Uh, stevia, there was a study in, in mice that showed that given one equivalent of one diet soda can worth of stevia to these mice, reduced their fertility rate by 55%. So, okay, it's not calories. It's not burnable energy. It is still uh, a chemical, and it's going to have chemical reactions in your body. So. I, you know, that's why, um, you know, my rule for myself is no plants or mushrooms, no sugar or any sweeteners and nothing artificial. So the diet Sprite and the gum, uh, I mean, gum comes from a plant anyway. Um, and the, and the sweeteners, you know, or the, any sweeteners and there's artificial sort of ingredients and things like that in there. So that sort of ticks all the no boxes for me. And, um, you know, so I would, I, I would avoid those for optimal health. I mean, you know, a bit of, you know, uh, sugar-free gum 
I mean, honestly, if I, I haven't chewed gum in six years or seven years, but if I were, I would probably chew it and like spit it out, like spit out the, the sugary uh, or non-sugary sort of sweetener flavors until it got down to being just bland and just chew on that. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, want uh, to, to consume any of that, um, to consume any of the, the artificial sweeteners or the sugar sweeteners. Okay. Uh, Serge XC, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm not seeing a question, but maybe maybe down the chain. Logan P. Smithberg, great name. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Dad is on a standard American diet, struggles with chronic back pain for 20 plus years. Um, he has AS, assuming that's ankylosing spondylitis, has tried almost everything and thinks it's irreversible. Uh, possible few spine stiffness, etc. Can the carnivore diet help? It certainly has helped other people with ankylosing spondylitis and other autoimmune diseases as well. And back pain. Oh my gosh, back pain um, and just pain in general, chronic pain. It just reduces inflammation. You're bringing in less of these inflammatory factors that are going to cause pain, and you're raising your ketones, which will reduce inflammation even further. They directly suppress inflammasomes that are going to cause more inflammation. And that's subsequently going to cause more pain. And so if you uh, go on a carnivore diet, yes, people's pains were dramatically reduced. M my back has, has hurt since I was a kid. At 15 years old, I would joke that I had like the back of a 60-year-old man. I was like, God, why does this always hurt? Um, and then all of a sudden for five years, six years in my 20s, it just didn't hurt at all. And I didn't have any back pain and problems. And then it started hurting again when I was sort of 27. I'm like, oh, that's weird. My back hasn't hurt in years. And uh, that's when I sort of slipped off and I started eating other garbage. Uh, not garbage. I was always whole food. I never, I never ate garbage. I mean, it's like very rarely. I mean, be once every few years that I'd get uh, fast food or something like that. And um, and then you know now you know I, I mean I just stopped eating carbohydrates in in my late 30s just because it it I, I just noticed that my back would hurt a lot more whenever I had anything with carbs in it. I'm like, mm, okay, so I sort of avoided that. And then, you know, getting rid of all the rest of the plants, it's, it's much, much better. So, you know, I still have a bit of a bit of pain and stiffness, but it's um, nothing compared to what it was before. And that's what a lot of people are talking about um, in their own experiences. And my patients, I've dramatically, uh, you know, reduced pain in some of these people that have had chronic pain issues for you know, 10 years, 12 years, 20 years. And they are on you know, fibromyalgia, and they're on all these uh, medications and opiates and injections, and nothing's really working. They're pretty miserable, and then they just go on a carnivore diet. And three months later, they don't have nearly the issues that they have. Or a month after, one gentleman came off all of his uh, opiates and medication that he'd been on for 12 years in one month on a carnivore diet. So yes, it can definitely help. Uh, there are absolutely people with ankylosing spondylitis that have improved their symptoms dramatically by going on a carnivore diet and any autoimmune issue is going to help. I, I've yet to see an autoimmune condition that doesn't improve dramatically on a carnivore diet. So uh, red meat and water is the most important. That's going to give him the least um, adverse effects. That's going to give him the most benefit. Uh, by being just red meat and just water. So good luck to him. Um, it's it's not going to turn back the hands of time, but it will definitely reduce inflammation. It can stop this from progressing further and significantly help his symptoms. Absolutely. I have uh, no doubt of that. He needs to be strict. He needs to be strict red meat and water, not even coffee. That will increase inflammation. That will cause pain. It'll be a lot better than it was, but it won't be as good as it can be. And so you you know, do at least 30 days of only red meat, only water, nothing gets in your system otherwise. And then you'll see how good you can actually feel. He'll see how good he can actually feel. And then adds in coffee and goes, nope, that's not working because that makes my back hurt a lot more. So, you know, get that baseline where you know that, you know, you can, where you know that you can, um, uh, you know, at, at least see how good it can possibly be. And then you add in different sorts of things so you can see that contrast on how you, you should feel and how that makes you feel. It's a big difference. It's a big, big difference. And that's why I don't touch anything else because 
I've seen that contrast and I don't like it. And I think that he'll he'll be he'll do the same if he's able to make it 30 days. I'm sure he will. You know, it's just I mean, if this if this can dramatically improve his life, like why not? Why not give it 30 days? You know, you can do anything for 30 days in the grand scheme of your life and it completely improve the rest of your life uh, for and, and give you decades longer. Like, why wouldn't you? You know, why wouldn't you uh, go for that? So in any case, good luck to him. Can someone who had a triple bypass do carnivore? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in fact, it's probably a great idea to, to do that. Anytime you have sort of medical issues, uh, these sort of serious medical issues, it's even more important to be on, on a proper diet, eating proper nutrition that's biologically appropriate for our species. And all the best evidence shows that that's a carnivore diet. And so for anybody asking any questions, you know, is it, you know, can someone with X do a carnivore diet? The answer is yes, because we're all humans. And just like, it's like saying, can all orca whales eat seals? Well, what about if they have that? Yeah, they're orca whales. They can, they can definitely eat seal. What about polar bears? Can they eat seal? What about if they have a tooth missing? Yes, they can definitely do that. They're just going to chew funny. You know, it's just, it's just the, the species, right? You know, can all cows eat the types of grass that cows typically eat, even if they're pregnant, even if it's a male, even if, yes, you know, uh, food is species specific and humans were carnivores. And again, herbivores eat meat too, if they can opportunistically, it doesn't hurt them. It is, it is still good for them, right? It's the plants that you have to avoid if you're not evolved to eat them. That's the problem. Those are the ones with the toxins in them, not the meat. So yes, you can definitely do a carnivore diet and it will, uh, you know, help in a lot of ways. And especially someone who's had a triple bypass, the last thing you want to do is keep doing what you were doing before that could put you in a position to, to get a triple bypass. And so hopefully this will help prevent future episodes that, that require surgery, etc. Linda Angerer, thank you very much for the super chat. Can you speak to kidney stones? My husband has multiple stones and was told to not eat meat. Uh, can you give uh, can you give me an understanding? Um, I mean, just ask him for the data on that. Just ask him to say, okay, you know, is, is there a study that shows that eating meat causes kidney stones? Uh, I can tell you right now there aren't, and uh, certainly no. Um, yeah, no, there's just none. I mean, it's just nonsense. I mean, what the hell in meat is going to cause a kidney stone? You know, can cause kidney stones? Plant toxins like oxalates. 75% of, of kidney stones are calcium oxalate stones. That does not come from meat. That comes from plants that contain oxalates, like spinach and things like that, and the many others. And so, no, that's that's not the case. Um, you know, doctor, it's just weird. You know, some people just gotten you know, caught up in this hype, this plant-based hype that just meat is awful, meat is awful. So, oh my God, your kidneys, oh, you got to stop eating meat. When the hell did that happen? You know, people just having just, you know, fulminant kidney failure and kidney stones going back to antiquity because we've always eaten meat, you know, and yet we're having this rise in these problems more recently. It doesn't make any sense. And, um, the, you know, if they're saying, oh, well, your, your kidneys are damaged, uh, from kidney stones, so you don't want to stress them out more, so you don't want to eat meat because higher protein can cause damage to your kidneys. Well, first of all, no, they can't, but you know, maybe that's what they're talking about if they think that. But the studies actually show that higher protein consumption improves kidney function, it doesn't lessen it. And so, no, you don't have to, you don't have to avoid uh, meat for, for kidney stones. In fact, that's the thing that's going to protect you against it because you're not bringing in a whole bunch of stuff that can precipitate kidney stones like the oxalates. Now, there's some people that down the road, years down the road, they can get oxalate dumping and they can still get calcium oxalate stones after the fact. But that's because they've built up so many oxalates in their tissues and their body's trying to get rid of all this crap. And it's going out in your kidneys and it's binding the calcium and doing all that. And, um, and that's, is um it is possible to do that down the road but that's again the oxalates from years and years and years of eating eating uh, high oxalate foods like spinach so no meat does not cause kidney stones at all whatsoever full stop and it does not cause kidney dysfunction at all whatsoever full stop in fact it improves kidney function i've seen this again and again and again and that's what the literature shows as well 
Hi, Ken. Thank you very much for the super chat. Um, carnivore for five months. My blood pressure has improved, and I now get lightheaded getting up too quickly on my current dose. What can be done getting off the meds altogether? So that, that's what I was talking about earlier with the other gentleman asking about blood pressure medication. That's a sign that your blood pressure is too low with the medication. So, yeah, definitely work with your doctor and talk to them and say, hey, I'm getting these light dizzy spells. Start checking your, your blood pressure at home uh, just normally at rest. And then when you get that lightheadedness, check your blood pressure. And so you get those data points in and say, hey, look, my blood pressure is you know, 105 over 60 uh, normally, and then, you know, I, I get up and all of a sudden drops down to like 80 over 40 or something like that. So that, that's clearly a case, you know, you, you have, you know, clear evidence to your, to present to your doctor, say, Hey, I need to reduce this. So depending on, on the medication that you're on, um, depending on the dose that you're on, you, you may need to reduce in a stepwise progression, or maybe you're just on the lowest dose and you can just come right off, but that's something you'll need to talk to your doctor about. But it definitely sounds like you, that's time to do that. You're you're getting symptomatically uh, low blood pressure at that point, and that's that sounds like what's happening there. So definitely a good time to talk to your doctor about that. Miguel Diaz, thank you very much for the super chat. Is it possible to remove arterial plaques from arteries? If so, how? Well, surgically, take those and arterectomies uh, have been, uh, is, uh, is a common procedure, common enough anyway, but um, there are limited studies showing that the body does this itself. However, there are some, like so the lean mass hyperresponder data um, with Dave Feldman and Nick Norwitz, they found that um, people on a ketogenic diet, high fat, meat based ketogenic diet, where their LDL cholesterol was elevated far past what is considered the normal upper limit, which I don't consider the upper limit. I think that it's exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, when the LDL goes up like that in that circumstance, when you're on a carnivore keto diet, um, but with this elevated, well, what they term elevated LDL cholesterol um, is, uh, you know, and if LDL just causes heart disease, then obviously we should see heart disease develop in these individuals that were at these elevated levels, quote unquote, elevated levels for um, uh, average of 4.7 years. And in fact, they found no progression in atherosclerotic plaques. In fact, the trend was to reduce atherosclerotic plaque. And there are studies with meditation, funny enough, that that was sort of one of the main interventional trials that has ever shown that you can reverse arterial plaques and that for 40 minutes a day, if you meditate, do mindful meditation for 40 minutes a day, calm yourself, relax yourself, get your cortisol levels down, uh, stress levels down, that um, you can actually uh, reverse atherosclerotic plaques. So yes, it can be done. It has been shown with the uh, you know, meditation studies. And we're starting to see that in the Dave Feldman studies and seeing it anecdotally. I have I've patients and people that I've worked with online or in my Patreon group, uh, who have absolutely started to reverse this, and there, and case reports are starting to be uh, put up as well. So there, there are people, um, you know, Dr. Jamie Seaman, like her husband, reversed his plaques, and they're talking, and and um, when speaking to her, they were thinking about writing it up uh, as a case report and getting it in the literature. I don't know if they've done that. That was something that that she mentioned, and then I've had uh, people in my patron group. One one guy, uh, Chip, he had a 100% occlusion, complete occlusion of his, uh, I believe, his right carotid artery. And now it's patent. It's still very narrowed, but it's open now. That's not supposed to happen. So it is going backwards. And basically, you just eat a natural diet and you stop exposing yourself to harmful things like cigarettes and alcohol and sugar and, and uh, plants in general. And your body can heal from all sorts of things that you know, it, uh, it was thought not possible to heal from previously. So that's what I would, that's what I would say. And, um, you know, if you're just doing what your body, if you're just eating what you're supposed to eat, your body's going to do what it's supposed to do. And it's going to heal from everything that it can heal. And it appears that people can actually start healing from atherosclerotic plaques as well. Uh, stress is a major one. Sleep is a major one. These are, these are things, you know, that it's not just diet that comes into play here, but that's a major, major, major uh, fundamental um, issue here is, is what we're eating, what we're putting into our body 
but also stress, also sleep. Uh, optimize your sleep and um, you really prioritize your sleep and reduce stress as well and fix your diet and I think you'll be fine. The dude, thank you very much for the super chat. Type 2 diabetic, eating full carnivore, just wondering. Uh, I have some decrease in my blood sugar, but considering I have no sugar going uh, in, act thought I may have dropped more. I would have thought I would have dropped more. Calcium score, uh, will carnivore help? So, okay, so sort of piecing that together, type 2 diabetic eating full carnivore, um, had have had some decrease, but thought it would, would do more. It just takes time. So you, you still need to be on medication if you're prescribed medication until that gets down to a point that you can safely come off of this and you don't get elevated rises. But, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, if you've been diabetic for years and decades, that means that you've had insulin resistance for another decade to 15 years on top of that. So this is a, this is a long process. It is taking you a long time to get here. It's going to take you a while to get out. It's not going to take 15, 20, 30, 40 years to get out of it like it took you to get into it. But, you know, there's 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 no shortcuts. So, you know, it's like if you walk 10 miles into the woods, you got to walk 10 miles out. You know, like that's, that's all there is to it. Your body has to heal and it takes time to heal. So your blood sugar is dropping. It is coming down. And that's a good thing, right? Still take the medications if you need it to keep that blood sugar below, you know, in that optimal threshold because... You need to because higher blood sugar kills people. That's a problem. And so, you know, and just and just be patient. You know, it's early days. I mean, it's, it's you know, it'd be one thing if it was like a decade and you're like, oh, this really isn't shifting. But look, it's, it's, it's something that you need to give time. It took you decades to get into the current position that you're in now. You know, a few months or even a year or two isn't really all that much. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, considering how long it took you to get here. So you need to give your body a chance to heal as well. Uh, calcium score, we don't really know one way or the other, but my, my suspicion would be yes. It does seem to help with plaques. Plaques are different than just calcium scores. Calcium score doesn't say anything about the soft plaques. So you could have more calcification, but smaller soft plaques. And your CAC score goes up, but your total plaque and total occlusions go down, you know? So that's not really um, uh, gonna tell you a full picture just by looking at the CAC score. But, you know, but the thing is you just check it once a year, once every two years, and you just and you just see what happens. Eventually, I would expect that to come down, yes. And certainly your plaques in general, like your soft plaques, I would expect those to come down as well. Um, but you know, we're still waiting on, you know, more long-term data. The the Dave Feldman stuff is sort of the longest that we have at the moment. And that's for keto, not even pure carnivore. Um, it's, uh, but they show this trend down, show the, the reversal in um, atherosclerotic plaques, which is great. So that's what I would expect to see uh, is that given time, that CAC score and your plaques in general will, will recede. That is what the, that is what the trend seems to show at the moment. Mr. Nauk Fenor. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for the super chat. Michael in chat is wondering if um, carnivore diet is appropriate for someone that has had a triple bypass. Cheers. Um, yeah, I think I think we we spotted that. Yeah, so it is. It is definitely um, it is definitely appropriate for someone with a triple bypass or quadruple bypass or a quintuple bypass and probably more so because uh, they have this atherosclerotic disease and this is going to be the thing that's going to reduce inflammation reduce that uh, the, the things that are going to precipitate more accumulation of atheros atherosclerotic plaques and hopefully reverse it but um, you know we have only pre preliminary data on that now we don't have hard evidence that we'll do that but certainly a lot of case reports and certainly, you know, Dave Feldman showing that trend to decrease is already very positive. Jill, Jill, thank you very much for the super chat. Will carnivore help if someone has RYR1? Well, it depends on what RYR1 is. <laughs> Let me just look that up real quick. RYR1. 
Um, so it's got a little muscle sort of issue. It has to do with um, calcium release. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's not. Oh, announced RYR1 database presentation at the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Okay, I don't know. Is that something that um, has to do with muscular dystrophy? I'm not sure. It's not something I've come across before. Um, let's take a look. Sorry. A little boring when other people are looking things up. But um, it has to do with, with uh, calcium release in your muscles. I'm not too sure. Um, it's... Um, it's possible, but I, I don't actually know much about that disease, unfortunately. Um, so I don't know. Uh, but, you know, a lot of these issues, you know, you have a genetic predisposition for something and then you have an environmental trigger. And so sometimes you, you're not going to get the presentation of the disease or the symptoms um, just by having the genetics. Uh, you, you need other things to, to, to go along with that. And so that's, that's quite a lot of diseases. And so when you remove the different sort of envir environmental triggers and factors, uh, many of which will come from the food that we eat inappropriately or the lack of nutrients that we, we need, that, um, that that can precipitate that. There's something in muscular dystrophy that I mentioned that I don't know its association with muscular dystrophy. But the interesting thing about muscular dystrophy that I, that I found out that I've, I've spoken about before is that cows have muscular dystrophy and it's exactly the same presentation apparently from what I've been told by veterinarians and uh, ranchers uh, that this is the same this is the same presentation of muscular dystrophy in humans except they know that it's nutritional so they call it nutritional muscular dystrophy in cows and it's a selenium deficiency so they have a d deficiency in selenium and because of their specific genetics that deficiency in selenium ends up presenting as muscular dystrophy. So that sort of begs a question, is, is this a, a nutritional deficiency in humans? Um, worth finding out. I mean, Jesus, like, why wouldn't you? You know, I mean, I, I, like, why isn't that? I mean, obviously, you know, you, don't, you know, vets and doctors don't necessarily talk about all these sorts of things. But, you know, you, you would have hoped that, like, you know, vets at some point would have been like, hey, that's muscular dystrophy in cows and that's nutritional. Maybe we, maybe we should look into that for people too. I I mean, why? Ha hopefully that's been done, but I I don't I don't trust anybody in this. Um, that question needs to be answered. And so you know, if you have a child or you yourself have muscular dystrophy, you know, it's, it's generally pretty uh, difficult, and you know, people can can die from this. Um, so, but if you have a family member or a child or someone you know has muscular dystrophy, find out, you know, put them on a carnivore diet, check their selenium, you know, check their other micronutrients, correct anything that's missing, put them on just a meat and water diet, red meat and water diet with a bit of liver and some organs every now and then, see what happens. Um, I am very curious about that. Could that be with the, the RYR1? Don't know. Uh, it's not something I know about and I haven't come across. Uh, certainly not in the context of the carnivore diet even and so but again worth finding out it's one of those things that you just it's going to help you in a thousand other ways anyway it may help you in this might as well check it out might as well try it out and then report back let people know um if there's forms that you're in uh and that has helped you or helped your loved one talk about it spread this around say hey this worked for me maybe it'll work for you too and, it's, and it helped me in all these other ways as well. And whatever condition that is, if it's if you're optimizing your health otherwise, it's certainly going to make that condition. Even if it doesn't help that condition, it's certainly going to help you live with that condition better because you're just going to be healthier in other respects anyway. So still definitely worth uh, the effort. Surge XC uh, says, I have severe mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, do you have any advice on improving and can the carnivore diet heal my condition? Um, so the thing is, there's, there's different causes of mast cell activation syndrome. Some of them are oxalates. That's one of the that's one of the known um, 
causes of mast cell activation syndrome. And so getting away from oxalates and just eating a carnivore diet can absolutely improve that. You're not bringing in a bunch of oxalates and, and, and uh, triggering off your mast cells. So a lot of things that we do and expose ourselves to, um, when we stop exposing ourselves to that, our body just starts calming down. So it could very well uh, improve uh, MCAS. Um, it has for other people. Um, it's stubborn and there can be other things that your body's reacting to outside of your diet. So you need to make sure that you eliminate those things as well. And obviously work with your doctor, but um, it's absolutely worth a shot because you're going to be removing out things that can trigger off MCAS. And, um, and it's, again, it's going to improve in so many other ways. Anyway, it can just make your life a lot easier and better uh, even with the MCAS. So good luck with that. I would definitely try it. Yes. Dova Squad 52, thank you for the super chat. Chafee is the best. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, let me see. Let me see here if we have any questions in the, the chat here with um, in um, in IG. So uh, there's one from uh, there's a question here in Instagram says uh, husband had a cardiac arrest after three months on a carnivore diet, he's 54 years, or sorry, 45 years old, taking a lot of pills now. He'd love to cut down uh, the pills for cholesterol, et cetera. Is there a chance that he can in the future? He was perfectly healthy. So I'm not sure why he had a cardiac arrest. The doc said his cholesterol was through the roof and says probably genetic. The eh. um, thing is you stop eating for five days, your, your, your LDL is gonna go through the roof. And basically it's gonna go back to exactly what it's supposed to be. Um, and it has nothing to do with eating fat or meat or anything like that. It has to do with not eating carbohydrates. And so it's just a metabolic state change. You have to mobilize fat around your body because your body's running on your fat stores instead of the carbs that you're eating. And you need cholesterol to mobilize that fat. The LDL cholesterol molecules are the transport molecules for uh, fat and energy. So that's what's happening there. Uh, it certainly wasn't carnivore diet. You know, you don't, you don't develop, um, you know, develop atherosclerotic and just deaden all your, your arteries in, in three months of any diet, you know, and if you were carnivore your whole life and then you switched, um, you know, and three months later or something happened, it, it likely wasn't because of the switch or something else happening. And so, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to go from no heart disease to heart attack time um, in three months of anything, of any diet or any change or smoking for three months or doing drugs for three months unless you really go after it, you know? So, um, you know, it's likely this is built up over a lifetime and then, you know, just, you still had plaques and hadn't reversed them. It takes a long time to reverse these. Even if they even can be reversed, it seems that they can, but we don't, we don't know that for sure, but that seems to be what's happening. Um, but it takes much longer than three months. You know, remember in the Dave Feldman, um, lean mass hyperspawners when they had this, you know, LDL that was through the roof, um, that they had, um, on average four and a half or sorry, 4.7 years at that level on this diet, this ketogenic diet. And, um, and the trend was coming down in atherosclerosis, but it wasn't like it was just, Oh, bam. It just like just dropped off completely. It was trending down, but this takes years to undo. So it takes years to build up takes years to undo. And so that's, that's likely what, what was going on there. Um, as far as the cholesterol medication is concerned, again, you know, this is just a metabolic state change. Your body is mobilizing fat around the body and it's those cholesterol molecules that are, that are doing that. And so I think that those are necessary. I don't think those are, those are damaging. I definitely don't think that they cause heart disease or atherosclerosis. Um, Always remember that we we've, we've had you know even the genetic conditions like familial hypercholesterolemia, um, so people that have you know through the roof LDL. That as that the same amount of that those genes have been in the population long before blood, um, cardiovascular disease became the number one killer in the world. You know this was this was unheard of in the 1800s and before. 
right? The first heart attack, first death by myocardial infarction in America, proven on autopsy, was in 1912. And they didn't believe it. They thought, like, well, we've all seen thousands of autopsies. We've never seen this here. We don't buy it. Ten years later, they started saying, like, oh, okay, we're seeing more of these. Like, yeah, I guess that guy, the guy did find something. Ten years after that, in the 1930s, it's the number one killer in America, right? We're eating less meat at that point than we had in 200 years, right? Before and after, right? So that doesn't make any sense, right? And before that, when this was unheard of, we still had people with the exact same rates of familial hypercholesterolemia in the population. So, so why, 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 why wasn't that causing heart disease and heart attack and strokes and things like that? So it's um, it's uh, it's a bit silly uh, to think that cholesterol causes this, and we know that the sugar companies just use cholesterol as a scapegoat to paint the blame on something else besides. Uh, sugar, because there were, there were studies coming out saying, hey, look, there's a strong association with, with refined sugar and, and access to sugar and heart disease. And uh, and they're like, well, no, we need to cover this up. So they did the opposition research. This is, what, this is what industry do. This is what big business does. This is what they, they just put out data. And, well, they put out fake data and studies to say that their product's safe and someone else is causing a problem. You know, this is just bullshit. We know that. It's published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2016, their own internal memos detailing how they paid off various professors from Harvard and elsewhere to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as a cholesterol, cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar and to exonerate sugar and say they was safe. It's just an empty calorie. That's where that term comes from. That's where that phrase comes from. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And he is the one who authored and published the USDA declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease, saying that saturated fat increased cholesterol. Stop eating both. Oh, my gosh. That was the first time the USDA had ever said, don't eat something as opposed to eat enough of everything. You need to get enough nutrients for that. Um, it was we were worried about malnutrition as opposed to uh, eating fat and having problems. It was just never a problem. And that's because we weren't eating high octane garbage like we started to in the 20th century with a bunch of refined processed seed oils and sugars and refined carbs and processed foods and all this garbage that uh, that came through. So cholesterol was never the problem. It wasn't a problem then. It's not a problem now. It wasn't a problem in the 1800s. And for thousands of years before that, that we've had records. And for millions of years before that, when we've been eating just solely meat, if cholesterol was a problem, if eating saturated fat and meat were a problem, it would have been a problem millions of years ago. Our ancestors that started eating meat and more fat, they would not have survived. They would have died out. They would have not have met their um, their um, evolutionary uh, goals and their the people the, the 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 our early ancestors that stuck to eating plants. They would have been the ones that survived, not the ancestors that switched to meat and got a survival advantage from eating meat because the plant based ones that were eating more plants, those lines died out. It was during the ice ages when the ice shell, shelves came down that Homo habilis, who was carnivorous and became an apex predator, was able to contend with just eating meat and taking down big, massive animals that way outclassed us by every physical metric. They're the ones that survived because they're the one because eating meat gave a survival advantage over eating plants. So it would have been the other way around if uh, meat were bad for us and caused harm. And either way, over millions of years, you adapt to whatever the hell is in your environment if you are surviving, right? This is why people that have had more access, exposure to agriculture over the last 10,000 years, like Europeans and people from the Middle East and elsewhere, North Africa, parts of Asia, that and in Mesoamerica, things like that, that these people have had adaptations that that other indigenous populations that have only been uh, hit with ag agriculture more recently have not had. And so we still get sick, but we just get sick at lower rates than, say, the Plains Indians in America who were eating bison up until the late 1800s or the Native Australians who were eating just meat and hunting up until last century or two. Right. So, you know, life adapts and so we we have had some adaptations in some populations over ten thousand years so what about over five million years that we've been eating meat six million years eight million years 
two million years of being apex predators. Of course, we're going to adapt to that. If there was anything bad in it, which there is not, there is nothing in meat that is harmful to you. Nothing, right? This is this is meat. Is this, is this harmful to you? Your own body it has just toxins in it. They're just killing you from the inside out. I mean, that's what these people are suggesting. They're suggesting that what you are made of is is killing you. And so if you eat that, that will kill you. And it's like, it makes no damn sense. You're eating things to get nutrients to make more meat and bones and tissue, right? You eat bone, eat meat, bones and tissue. You're going to get all those requisite materials. You're not getting a whole bunch of other stuff. Those materials are not harmful to you. Those materials are what you need. And then we're saying that our bodies just make things that just kill us, like our muscles, like our fat. Oh, my God. Uh, or the cholesterol. Your body's making something that's toxic. Why would we make LDL cholesterol in the first place if it was just toxic? If it was only toxic. It was just a matter of time. We're just going to get this. If you just go pure vegan, you, you don't, your LDL doesn't disappear. And so, you know, let's say we were herbivores, which we weren't. That's just dumb. Um, and, you know, even vegans don't even argue that we were, you know? So it's just like, so what the hell's the argument, you know? And so... But even just going just plants, your LDL doesn't go to zero. You know, it's not supposed to be zero. It's there for a reason. Your body's making this for a purpose. And then when we're just trying to disrupt that and we're getting sicker and we're having problems. And so, you know, LDL is not the problem. Cholesterol is not the problem. It never was, never will be. And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's up to you and your husband and, um, and what what you guys choose to do but i don't i don't you know the evidence is very clear that cholesterol was never the problem ever and that it was just blamed for heart disease when it was more likely sugar and processed foods and you know we just need to get away from that we just need to stop talking about it like no that was a con it's con then it's con now we're just not going to talk about it and if it's not if it's not the problem if that was the con in the first place we don't need to drop it. We don't need to reduce it. We don't need to take medicines to, to reduce it either. And I don't. That's why I don't. Um, I, my cholesterol is uh, higher than the than what is considered uh, the you know the threshold for needing treatment or whatever. Couldn't care less. Could not care less. That's exactly what it's supposed to be. I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat. My body's doing what it's supposed to do. And my body's mobilizing fat. That's what it's designed to do. My body's not going to be making a whole physiologically in a normal physiological state. It's not going to be making a whole bunch of chemicals that are just killing me, right? Unless I have some sort of rare genetic defect. But if everybody in the population is making LDLs, probably for a reason, right? So, uh, no, I don't. I, sorry, that's a 20 minute rant, but it's just garbage. It is just garbage, and we need to get away from it. We need to just stop thinking about cholesterol in those terms because it is not. The cause of heart disease it just isn't cody savage thank you for the super chat would it be more beneficial to use some carbs on a day i know i'll drink alcohol i've heard alcohol without carbs can do more damage to the body no nah, i haven't heard that myself um i would probably go the other way and if you're if you're uh, going to damage yourself with alcohol, the last thing you want to do is damage yourself more with carbs and alcohol and get a whole bunch of like sugar and sugary drinks and things like that. You know, fructose damages your liver in the same way as alcohol. So you actually get further damage to your, your liver by uh, having sugary uh, mixers with it. Uh, so no, I don't think it'd be beneficial. I think you do the, the least amount of exposure and the least amount of your harm uh, of harm possible. And, um, yeah, I mean, some people say, oh, yeah, you to eat a bunch of carbs to soak up the alcohol. Where'd that come from? I don't know. But it's, it's not, um, it's not uh, something that uh, I think anyone has ever shown me any evidence for. It's just something that people say, you know, as you're, as you're growing up partying and things like that. But, um, no, I don't think so. I don't think that's a good idea to have carbs ever or alcohol ever. But if you do want to have alcohol sometimes, I, I wouldn't make it worse by adding carbs. Um, okay, guys, I think I'm, I, I have a little more time today, so I'll probably go for another hour, um, probably end around noon. But then I've got to go get ready for work. So that's uh, one hour from now, but I've got a sort of a 
afternoon uh, clinic that, I'm, that I've got to do. So I'll probably go for another hour, um, but uh, maybe stop the super chats here because there's still, still a lot of them uh, that I need to get through and I don't want to, I don't want to miss uh, out on, on anybody. Um, so I don't, I don't like doing that, but you know, have to stop short of in about an hour. So, okay. Jesse and Megan, uh, Okay. All right. Sorry about that. My, my internet glitched out. Um, okay. So let's see if everything's sort of going here. Okay. So red meat, red and salt water for three months, gained 20 pounds, mentally feeling better. That's great. Uh, question is over had step two and congestion earaches, um, sandpaper, itchy eyes, red eyes is getting sick or cold to normal for some yeah you can still definitely get sick um it's generally less severe and um it's generally less severe and and less often but you, you can definitely still get sick and um it's just that your your immune system is going to be much better so yeah and it's great you know it sounds like you wanted to gain gain weight some people are, are you know underweight they want to put on muscle they want to put on lean body mass it sounds like you have and that's so that's really great um but yeah no you can still definitely get sick i mean i've like i said you know i've, I've sort of felt a bit run down and been like oh i'm sort of fighting something off there's there was one time i think that you know i got i got covid and um just felt pretty rotten for you know it, it hit me sort of in the late afternoon i felt pretty rotten went to sleep woke up feeling pretty rotten and then sort of cleared up and i was better after that and I was just a bit run down and tired for the rest of the week. And that was it. Uh, and my neck hurt for some damn reason. My neck hurt like hell. And um, that was it, you know. And um, and then I think the, the worst one I got was I got, like, exposed to a flu uh, when I first came to Australia. Um, and I hadn't, you know, gotten flu shots or anything like that. And I, I hadn't, I'd been in America, so I hadn't been exposed to the strains that were bouncing around Perth. And so I didn't have a, a, the, sort of the built up sort of uh, a crossover protection that you would get from other exposures and uh you know and i felt pretty rotten and uh but that you know got over that you know fairly quickly as well and haven't been six since really that was it those were sort of the two times in six years that i've been sick otherwise i just sort of feel a bit run down and then i get over it so yes you can still get sick but it's it's much more reduced both in frequency and severity motivational misfit thank you very much for the super chat do fruits and vegetables cause cancer hard to say about cause and effect you know when you don't have um uh you know well thought out well planned out um single variable randomized control trials but there are there are substances in fruits and vegetables that have been shown to be carcinogenic and yes, can cause cancer, at least in animal models. they found to be mutagenic, carcinogenic. Um, that's not according to me, that's according to the WHO and botany books and various studies on the subject. We're looking at these things in animals showing that these things can cause cancer. A lot of these things can damage the mitochondria. Anything that damages the mitochondria long-term is likely to be able to cause cancer because can the hallmark of cancer is uh, damaged mitochondria that can't function properly. Mitochondria are vital for the normal functioning of your cell 
and division of yourself because it's the, the mitochondria that act as the policeman for cell division. The cell is trying to divide and the, and the mitochondria, if they see something wrong and they don't want it to divide, they stop it from happening. But if they're damaged and they can't stop it, then it just divides uncontrolled. The mitochondria have to be functional to stop cell division. And so if you have damaged mitochondria, you get unregulated cell growth and division. That's what cancer is. And if the cell is damaged and it has says, oh, no, we got a program cell that we got to just shut it down. It's the mitochondria, the mitochondria that action that. So they're the policemen. They're also the executioner. So they're saying, oh, hey, nope, not doing that. We're stopping here. But now they're damaged. They're not there. So, you know, the riot continues. And then, you know, saying, no, we got to shut this down. And uh, but they can't action that if they're if they're damaged. So you do things that damage the mitochondria. You can precipitate cancers. Cyanide directly damages the mitochondria. Omega-6, like linoleic acid, directly damage the mitochondria. A lot of these different plant toxins directly damage the mitochondria. Fructose can damage the mitochondria. High blood sugar can damage the mitochondria. Deuterium, high levels of deuterium can damage the mitochondria. Do damage the mitochondria. So, um, and that's what people don't know about deuterium. It's very interesting. It's heavy hydrogen. So it's hydrogen proton with a neutron. So it's the it's the most different isotope that we, that we have. It's double the weight uh, with the same charge, right? So you have, you know, um, you know the different different sort of uh, isotopes of the different atoms. Um, they'll they'll maybe have a couple of neutrons different, but they've got fourteen protons or sixteen protons, and maybe they've got a different number of neutrons. But that that doesn't change the weight and size as much as doubling it you know if you had you know 14 protons you don't have anything with 28 neutrons you know what i mean it's like it's like that's massive and so um or you know 14 neutrons whatever so like it's it's just a massive massive difference you know or you go from 14 to 28 neutrons or something like that that's a big difference that's a big 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 difference um hydrogen quite often has one proton and every now and then about one in every 6500 of these suckers will have a neutron on top of it is double the size that goes through these little molecular motors in the mitochondria and it's like a throwing a bowling ball into a blender it's just just going to just destroy the gears so it destroys them. and then that can't function properly the more you do the higher you deuterium the more those things get damaged and they they overwhelm your body's capacity to fix them and the mitochondria break down and so you know there's a lot of these things in there fruit and vegetables have high deuterium being in a, in a ketogenic state will lower your deuterium because your uh, mitochondria actually make metabolic water. Every one kilo of fat that you burn in your mitochondria produce 1.1 liters of deuterium-free water. So you're lowering your total deuterium levels down, uh, whereas like fruits and vegetables, they can have quite high levels of deuterium and they put you out of ketosis. And so you're just damaging and damaging and damaging your mitochondria. So, you know, it, it, you eat an apple every day. Is that going to give you cancer? Probably not, you know, but this is, this is just, this stuff just builds up in your body and it just sort of damages you as you go. And just eventually you can just overwhelm your system and you get cancer. So yes, there, ha there are, um, there are chemicals and naturally occurring chemicals in fruits and vegetables that have been shown to be carcinogenic yes uh in in uh, mostly in animal models so uh, take that for what it is but that's that's what the data is is that in a lot of these animal models they've shown that these can be carcinogenic and mutagenic so they have carcinogens this is why i stopped eating plants 24 years ago because my cancer biology professor at university of washington in seattle uh, showed us there's 136 carcinogens just in Brussels sprouts and over 100 in mushrooms and over 80 in spinach and celery and cabbage and cucumbers and and uh, you know all these other sorts of fruits and vegetables that we would eat uh, on a regular basis and um, you know so there are carcinogens if there is a carcinogen in them that means that that chemical can precipitate cancer down the road in sufficient quantity and exposure right and some of these a lot of these things have been done in animals and so um you know is that perfectly translatable to humans not always so take that for what it is but yes there are known carcinogens in fruits and vegetables yes 
Julie Dismukes, thank you very much for the super chat. Been doing carnivore for a few weeks and cholesterol came back super high um, at uh, 327, HDL 61, LDL uh, 259, triglycerides 58. Doctor wants me on Lipitor, but I want to wait it out since I just started. Thoughts and advice, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, your that looks great. Your HDL is great. Your triglycerides are great. You have more HDL than triglycerides, which means you're metabolically very healthy. Um, and so you almost certainly have pattern A LDL, which is the, the large buoyant LDL molecules, which you are supposed to have. Those are the ones you make and aren't damaged. And the, um, yeah, and the, the thing is that the cholesterol was never a problem. Full stop. And, um, you know, it's, it's a metabolic state change. If you just start eating carbs for a week or two, your LDL will come down. You eat Oreo cookies for two weeks, your LDL will come down. Right. So Oreo cookies good for your heart. I, I hope your doctor doesn't think that. Um, but, you know, you know, as you go, your LDL may come down a bit. But I, I you know, wouldn't really worry too much if it doesn't because it's supposed to do that. You're mobilizing fat around your body and it's LDL that does that. LDL is moving fat around your body for you. So, of course, it's going to go up. You need it to go up. Right. That's part of being fat adapted is you're moving fat around your body so you can run on it. And so, you know, if that that doesn't go down. Who cares? You know, again, we've been eating meat forever. We've had familial hypercholesterolemia in the same rates of genetic expression for hundreds of years, thousands of years, however long. But at least the last couple hundred years when heart disease was non-existent, really, you know, first heart attack in America confirmed on autopsy in 1912. There's one obscure reference to it from a from a, a you know presentation in um, the late 1700s, and probably in Europe somewhere. I don't know exactly where, where they said that there's like, oh well, we looked at this on his autopsy and looked like there's just thrombus in the coronary artery. It's like, so you got, you got one maybe something kind of in the 1700s, and then one actual confirmed death on autopsy from myocardial infarction, 120 years later nothing in between there right so why is that we still had cholesterol then we still had ldl then people were eating a lot more meat and fat then a lot more and a lot less junk and they were smoking and drinking but 80 percent of men smoked back then you know why is this well because it's just complete garbage you know it was never the problem in the first place and it's not the problem now um so, you know, and what does Lipitor do? It doesn't, doesn't get rid of the SDLDL or the other damage. It gets rid of, it stops your body from making large buoyant LDL molecules. Those are ones you want. So, you know, I, I think this is just a simple, simple misunderstanding of, of the physiology. And, you know, again, you know, the Journal of American Medical Association published actual internal memos from the sugar company showing that this was a farce, that this was, this was a scapegoat that they used to stop people from blaming sugar when that's probably exactly who should have been blamed. It certainly wasn't fat and meat. Um, that has never caused a problem. Why the hell would it cause a problem now? So because of that, we just throw it out and be like, look, cholesterol doesn't cause heart disease. Don't care that my LDL is that high. Uh, studies with 11 million people have shown that higher LDL of any description, there's over a hundred different kinds of LDL, first of all. So that's something that you should be aware of as well. Um, that higher LDL of any description is associated with longer life. Okay. So what's the problem here? You know, like, uh, so I'm looking at that going like, great, you're going to live longer. Why would you want to lower that? I wouldn't want to lower that. I don't want to lower that. So I don't lower that, uh, in myself or in my patients. I, I never checked her, um, cholesterol in my patients unless they specifically asked for it because I think it's a complete waste of time and money. It was, it was not, is not the marker that we were told it was. And it's a bloody waste of time looking at it uh, for that reason, because it was a lie. That's it. That's all there is to it. So those are my, my two cents on it. And um, if you really wanted to just get your doctor off your back, eat some carbs for two weeks. They'll come right down and you get that test. And go, oh, wow. They look better now. Great. Stop eating the carbs after that and move on with your life. Uh, Bruce Lynch, thank you very much for the super chat. 
I tested positive for centromere <clears throat> antibodies. Can red meat and water help me? I have uh, started a carnivore diet for a month now. I have no clinical symptoms at this time. Does the meat have to be grass fed as it is expensive? Uh, no, it doesn't necessarily have to be grass fed uh, unless you are reacting to grain finished beef. But most people don't, even with autoimmunity. You have antibodies towards yourself. That means you have an autoimmune condition. And every autoimmune condition I've ever seen responds very well to a pure red meat and water diet, but stick with red meat. Uh, it doesn't have to be grass fed and finished. If you can get it, that's great. Um, that is that is objectively better, but you likely won't notice a difference in your health and in your autoimmunity if you, if you just use grain finished as well. Um, so yeah, so that's perfect. Just yeah, red meat and water, that's it. And, but grain finished is okay. If you, if you seem to have problems with that, um, try the grass fed and finished. And if that makes you even better, do what you can to try to get that. If you go directly to a farmer, a rancher, and you buy one of their cows direct from them, it is going to be miles cheaper than, than just buying it, you know, ad hoc from a store in steak form. If you buy a whole loin of ribeye or New York or whatever, that's even cheaper than just buying steaks. You just cut those things up yourself and, and you've got a bunch of steaks at you know generally half the price. They generally charge you uh, double the price just to cut it for you. So you know, don't do that um, if you can. And uh, yeah, no, but um, I'm glad that you're giving this a try. I'm, I hope I'm hopeful that it will uh, help you. You have no clinical symptoms, which is perfect. Keep it that way uh, by, by staying on a red meat and water diet. Good luck with that. Copper's Carnivore Kitchen. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. You did not have to do that. Congrats on busting through 250,000 subs. Uh, thank you for all you do uh, for all of us. And thank you to El Marie for sharing uh, so much of you with us. Well, thank you very much. It's very sweet of you. And thank you everyone for you know supporting me and supporting the channel. 250,000 is <laughs> pretty crazy. Um, I didn't have any sort of aspirations or goals or anything like that when I started a YouTube channel. I just you know, thought I had something to say and just wanted to say it and just get that out there. I was actually considering not doing as much and just leaving it as is because I had these sort of these discrete videos that I thought were pretty good and encapsulated all the things that I wanted people to know about. And I didn't know if making more videos was just going to sort of drown it out. Um, and that, that can be the case. You know, it it's can be difficult uh, to find some of these things. You know, there's like hundreds of videos on my channel now. And um, so that can be difficult. To that end, if people do want to sort of go to like the sort of the curated list of what I think are some of the most important ones to know about, I've made a playlist called uh, Getting Started on a Carnivore Diet. And it has ones on how to do a carnivore diet properly, like carnivore for beginners, um, fasting or um, fiber constipation and diet, frequently asked questions. What about fruit and honey? What about dairy? What about coffee and tea and caffeine? Basically don't eat them. And then the ones on why, why to do it, why it's important, why it matters. And um, those I think are the most important when you understand that and you understand just how important it is to not eat this garbage and to eat as much fatty meat as your body's asking you for, uh, it makes a huge difference in, in how you approach this and how you you know, go forward and say, okay, I'm gonna stick to this because this is really important for me. And you're seeing all these positive benefits that you know, I can call out exactly in this stepwise progression. And then you're seeing that in real time. You're like, wow, okay. So everything that he's saying is gonna happen has happened. I'm feeling better in the ways that he's described. And now I know why. Okay, well, this is this is a lifestyle for me now. I'm not just it's not just a temporary diet. I'm just gonna do this. And so if people uh, want to go see that, it's uh, yeah, it's getting started on a carnivore diet. It's a playlist there. And I have ones on cancer. I have ones on athletics and building muscle and those sorts of things. So the playlist can be can be helpful as well to sort of look for uh, individual ones. I should probably do one. I'll do another one on mental health as well because that that I've got several uh, ones on there that are that are really important. Eating disorders also as well. Uh, female issues, PM, um, PMDD and PCOS, fertility issues and fibroids. 
uh, those can all be helped by diet. And um, those are some of the least watched videos on my channel, but um, but they're important. You know, this affects a lot of people. So those exist. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa, for that very nice uh, sentiment. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all your help. Thank you and everybody else for your support and your help and for getting the message out there. It's really important. You know, if you guys aren't sharing this with people, it doesn't get shared and people don't see it. And then people don't get helped. And that's that's why I want to do this because I, I don't like seeing people get hurt, especially when it's something so simple, so simple to change. And they can they can be uh, they can dramatically improve their life. And we're, you know, there are people are trying to help. Them. You know, they're trying to do the right thing. They say, oh, well, only nine percent of people are following the guidelines. Who gives a shit? Thank God only 9% of people are following the guidelines because guidelines suck. 9% of people in America are diabetic too. Do you think about that? Maybe those are the ones following the guidelines. And, um, you know, the thing is, is that even if you're not perfectly following the guidelines, the guidelines have shifted everybody towards more plant-based, more processed foods, less meat, less fat, more seed oils, more sugar, more fruits and vegetables more grains, more carbs, more garbage, right? And so we're going away from red meat. We're going away from saturated fats. We're going towards polyunsaturated fats and plant garbage and processed foods. And people are getting sicker. It's causing problems, right? So even if there's not perfectly adhering to the guidelines, they're going towards the guidelines. And just going towards the guidelines has made people very sick. So not good. And um, without you guys sharing this and helping people and getting this out to people and coming to these live events, coming to the premieres that I put out and watching the videos and sharing them with your friends, this doesn't get out there. And so thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it because I'm trying to just get the message out there. That's all I want to do. I don't, this is not my, I have a job, <laughs> I have a day job. It's, it's, um, and it's very fulfilling and, um, and I get paid for it. And so that's, I'm happy with that. I'm not trying to do this as a job. You know, I'm not like you know, the Lane Nortons and the, and the Simon Lewis's out there. Well, this is their job. And so they have to desperately cling to their narrative and, and not give any inch because I have to be right. They, they, they need to get, they got real jobs. If they had real jobs and we're just, you know, uh, beholden on their influencing and that nonsense, then they probably would have a different perspective on things. Um, I don't I have a day job and this actually takes time away from that, which I'm willing to do because it's important. But, you know, you look at Dr. Kiltz, I mean, that dude is very successful. He has one of the most successful fertility practices in America, you know, and he's uh, he's very, very successful, very well off. He does not have to do any of this stuff. This does not benefit him from a financial point of view. He is doing this purely because it helps people. Dr. Baker as well, he left a very lucrative surgical practice in order to to focus on metabolic medicine um you know casey means she was finishing a um her residency in head and neck surgery at stanford was going to take a faculty position uh when she finished and she went complete left field and went into metabolic health and metabolic medicine because it's the right thing to do and um and and so on you know dr barry like i mean he, he just he has other things in his life that he could do he could just sit on it you know, it doesn't have to do this stuff. And so, you know, it's um, you know, people that are doing this are doing this because it works, because it helps people and it's because it's important. But it doesn't get out there unless you guys share. it. And so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming here and for sharing with uh, with everybody, you know. And it's just a good thing to do, too, because your sphere of influence is going to get broader and broader and broader. And people are going to start listening to you and they're going to start getting better effects. And other people are going to see that and they're going to want to do it again and do it for themselves as well. It's just going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And that's how we get this. That's how we make this grassroots movement work because it's sure as hell not going to come down from the top down. There are too many trillions of dollars at stake for them to, to give up on this stuff easily. Like the statins, they're the most lucrative drug that's ever been put on the market. You think that they're ever going to tell you that you don't require statins? Not a chance in hell. We're going to have to pry that out of their cold, dead fingers. You know, that is always going to be there. They are not going to give that up. And so we have to make sure people understand that it is not necessary and it is likely causing more harm than good. So that all comes from you. So thank you, guys, everybody.
Okay, back on the questions. Emma Stephenson, uh, thank you very much for the super chat. Any thoughts on the lean mass hyperresponders? Yeah, so it's um, I, I think it's great. You know, I, I I think that there's clearly an abundance of evidence to show this the, the whole cholesterol hypothesis was complete bullshit in the beginning. It wasn't even a hypothesis. It was an it was a um, it was a propaganda scheme. It was a smear campaign to try to take the 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 blame off of sugar and processed foods. So it was never a hypothesis in the first place. No one ever went like, hmm, I think that this might be what it is. That was it was bullshit from the beginning. The you know Ansel Keys did not just come up with this on his own. The sugar companies came up with this and they paid off Ansel Keys to push it. That's what happened. And so uh, it's crap. It's total crap. And so yeah, there's there's an abundance of evidence for this. Half of people that have heart attacks in America don't have high cholesterol, have never had high cholesterol, and you lower their cholesterol even more, and they die more often. That was a study with over 150,000 patients, and half of them had low cholesterol, half of them had high cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Dead even. There wasn't even like a, a slight increase in in uh, uh, prevalent in the, the the high cholesterol group, right? But interestingly, they follow them for three years after that. And the ones that maintained so-called low normal LDL cholesterol and the ones that went from high to low through pharmacological and dietary means, they were twice as likely to have died in those three years of follow-up than the ones who maintained higher cholesterol. This is killing people. This is killing billions of people around the world. This is ruining their lives. So, you know, I think there's plenty of evidence. I mean, before um, Dave Feldman started doing this, I was already just like, yep, throw it out. This is crap. And I think there's more than enough evidence to do that. Um, it's hard for some people to sort of come around to that. So it's very important that this sort of work, like lean mass hyperresponders uh, stuff goes out there just to prove once and for all that this is total bullshit. And you do this in, in an experimental fashion. You have people doing this. You track their atherosclerosis. You say, look, it's not happening. It's not happening. It's not happening. Look at that. It's getting better, in fact. So you're dumb. And uh, you need that. And so I think he's doing great work. I'm really happy that he's, he's coming out with this stuff. It's absolutely fantastic. It doesn't show me anything that I, that I wasn't already convinced of already from the current literature. But it is going to help move that needle for a lot of other people and eventually it's just going to be no denying it. I think this is just complete bullshit and you need to throw it out and so that's very important work that he's doing chimed a monkey brains um thank you for the super chat i have pcos lupus and type 2 diabetes do you think that a carnivore diet can help me get pregnant uh left here and there <laughs> so it's like all these different things and then the pregnant thing so i have um I've had three miscarriages. I'm very sorry to hear that. I'm almost uh, 40. If so, what specifically do you suggest? Well, the thing is, is that PCOS is the leading cause of uh, uh, female infertility in uh, certainly the Western world anyway. Um, type 2 diabetes is very common to have along with PCOS because they're calling PCOS type 4 diabetes. Now, Alzheimer's has been called type 3 diabetes. Now, PCOS type 4 diabetes, basically insulin resistance and damage of the ovaries, diabetes of the ovaries. And so, yeah, I absolutely think that going on a carnivore diet can help in that regard because it can help reverse your PCOS. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I did do a, a video on PCOS and fertility that people can watch. It would be you along with about 4,000 other people. <laughs> Again, it's just my least watched video, um, but it's important. I think it's a good one and um, and uh, talks about that. And so, you know, that's something that's not just me, but this is in the literature that uh, ketogenic diets in general can reverse PCOS. And that's something that people are doing. Um, high insulin causes the, the ovaries to produce too much testosterone. Women make testosterone, or women and make men take, make testosterone first, and that's converted into estrogen. So high insulin will cause women to make too much testosterone and then it will block the conversion of that testosterone into estrogen. So you get too much testosterone, not enough estrogen, and you can get PCOS and get the, the hallmarks of PCOS. 
and you can get PCOS without all the hallmarks of PCOS, such as you know weight gain and, and uh, inappropriate hair growth and things like that. In men, it's the opposite. You don't get enough testosterone. It actually suppresses your testosterone, suppresses your growth hormone, suppresses growth hormone in men and women, and the action of growth hormone in men and women. That's important. And so uh, also another reason you shouldn't eat a bunch of carbs before you go to bed because it just it depresses your uh, the the action of the growth hormone that you get after you go to sleep, which is your maximal dosage is after you go to sleep, if you go to sleep on time, which is also why uh, getting proper sleep at proper times is really important. Um, but yeah, lupus, uh, I, all my patients that have had lupus have significantly improved. Everyone I've seen online with lupus uh, going on carnivore has significantly improved. Again, any autoimmune condition, you need to be very strict, red meat and water for best results, really cut out everything else, even coffee and, and other sort of sweeteners, non-sugar sweeteners. And yeah, and just, just get on to just meat and water diet, red meat and water diet. That should help all of those. That should put all of those into remission or at least significantly improve them. And so that can help with fertility, certainly. Um, there are many different causes of miscarriages, but putting in the wrong nutrition in your body, they have different sort of loads, you know, screwing with your hormones, screwing with the different sorts of chemicals that are going in your body that can cross the uterus and uh, across the placenta into the baby. You know, this can damage the baby. And vegans and vegetarians have higher rates of miscarriage. They have higher rates of birth defects. They have higher rates of kids with autism, right? So, you know, because you're not getting all the proper nutrients that the baby needs, and you're introducing things that are harmful to the baby. Um, there are other causes of miscarriage, of course. Sometimes it's just something that has a chromosomal issue or defect or something that your body decides this isn't compatible with life. And so it, it has causes of miscarriage because it needs to, because that baby wouldn't have, have formed properly and would have, would, would have been born, stillborn. You know, it's your body just says, okay, this isn't, this isn't working. And so that can happen too. And that's very sad, but it's not necessarily your fault. But you can get rid of all the things that that can get in the way of that. And going on our ancestrally appropriate, biologically appropriate diet can can do a lot to that end. It can definitely help with PCOS, lupus, and diabetes. Uh, so good luck with that. I hope that 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 helps. Superfluity of naughtiness. <laughs> very interesting names. Uh, thank you for the super chat. 260 pounds, six foot two, recently did a three day dry fast, followed by two more days with water. Then I went carnivore. I went, it went really smoothly and effortlessly compared to trying without the fast. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, I mean, you're a lot of things that you get from fasting is you're just, you're just not eating the wrong thing and you're, and you're getting into a metabolic state you're supposed to be in, you know, just fasting to get into it could potentially get you into that state quicker and a bit more seamlessly potentially and then perpetuate it. you know a lot of people don't have any problems going corner i had no problems going carnivore I, I i dropped all this crap and i just felt great right away the first time i did it 24 years ago and then the second time i did it six years ago felt fantastic both times the first time i was just sort of weird because i was just looking at all the things i couldn't eat and it was weird for me but i didn't feel sick i didn't feel unwell i wasn't getting at carb cravings and like oh my god i have to eat it it was just like oh, i can't eat that i can't eat that i can't eat that it was just it was just a logistical issue and it just sort of felt weird getting used to it then after two weeks i didn't even care um and this last time I, I didn't care either um and so it's um it can be seamless for people but that's that's good to know you know if, if someone's having you know, difficulty transitioning, you know, maybe they try that. Maybe you try fasting for a couple of days. I mean, be careful with it. You know, you don't want to, especially with the dry fasts, you know, I mean, you do make metabolic water. Like I said, your, your, your mitochondria make about 1.1 liters for every kilo of fat that you burn, but you know, you can get dehydrated. You can have too little water and, and hurt yourself. So do be careful with that. Um, I think the majority of benefit from fasting just comes from not eating the, the wrong things and from being in the correct metabolic state. Maybe fasting completely can help you get into that state quicker. Um, I'm really glad that that helps, helped you. Um, yeah, something to keep in mind for other people um, that, uh, that maybe have a, a more difficult time transitioning, maybe it could help them. But you know, um, 
Maybe not. It could be that you're um, having problems with a bit of electrolytes or you're just withdrawing from things and, and that's going to make it a bit more difficult. But anyway, I'm really glad that that went uh, seamlessly for you. Michelle Callie, thank you for the super chat. Uh, hi there. On carnivore diet for 43 days and feeling great. The only thing uh, that threw me off is um, the only thing that threw me off was a menstrual cycle was uh, a couple weeks late. Is that normal when starting carnival? It can be. It, it doesn't do it for everybody, but it, it it has happened and it can happen. It generally normalizes after a couple months. So sort of three, four months, five on the outside is typically what I've seen. People um, maybe get sort of a bit of derangement for three or four cycles. And then it sort of gets much more normalized after that. Even if they've had irregular periods before that, oftentimes it will it will normalize their periods. Everyone's a bit different on that, on how their bodies respond. But yes, your, your hormones are going to be changing a bit, right? And that's going to affect your cycles. And so, but that normalizes, that should normalize it. So just keep with it. Make sure you're getting enough fat. Make sure you're getting enough food. And, um, you know, just remember all your hormones are made from cholesterol. So your body's made of cholesterol, your brain's made of cholesterol, bile's made of cholesterol, um, so many important chemicals in your body. Vitamin D is made out of cholesterol. All these things are very important. So get enough cholesterol. Don't get, you know, the idea is, oh, too much cholesterol. No, you need enough cholesterol. Your body makes it for a reason. It's there on purpose. You need it. It's important. And we're being told to curtail it. And what do you know? Uh, we've been fighting against our own cholesterol for 50 years and testosterone and hormonal issues are at their all time worst. In 2000, there was a, a paper that came out that said um, that men in their 20s now aren't half the man their grandfathers were. And they said that because the that men in their 20s in the 2000s had half the testosterone levels on average that the average 60 year old man had in the 1970s. Right now it's worse. And women are having more deranged hormonal problems as well. We're just saying, get rid of cholesterol. Oh, my God, get rid of fat, cholesterol, all these sorts of things. And our hormonal health is being destroyed. Our fertility rates are being destroyed. Uh, that's not a coincidence. Like, this is a problem. Your brain is largely made out of cholesterol. You need that. And we're telling p people to put kids on statins. If they, Why are you checking a child's bloody cholesterol? Oh, my God, put them on a statin. Are you out of your damn mind? The brain is made out of cholesterol. And you're putting a statin in their body that can cross the blood-brain barrier potentially and stop the brain from making cholesterol. It's so important to your brain to have cholesterol. It bloody well makes it. And now you're giving them drugs to stop that? Are you out of your damn mind? Like, it pisses me off. You are damaging the development of that child. You're damaging the, the brain health, the neurological health, the mental health, the, the, the cognition of adults and elderly adults in particular this is wrong this is wrong and it needs to be stopped so uh but yes your menstrual cycles can go off yes <laughs> sorry i go on a lot of tangents i know um jordan whitehead thank you very much for the super chat i have a small two millimeter acom aneurysm any way that i could heal it not needing any surgery later in life um, ozone IV therapy and HBOT diet or others. Uh, not that I know of, um, you know, that's a structural defect at that point. You know, can the body heal from some of these things? Potentially bodies do heal from all sorts of, um, things, you know, that, that overgrowth and out pouches of, of different sorts of things and polyps in the colon and skin tags on the skin, you know, that has to do with, uh, insulin resistance. Um, but, you know, like think about diverticulitis or diverticulosis, I should say, where this, you've got this damaged out pouching of the colon. I don't think that that actually does recede and, and heal up. Not that I know of anyway, um, potentially. But, um, you know, I, I don't I don't have any I don't have any way of saying one way or the other. Um, the important thing is, is just you keep an eye on it. So a two millimeter acom aneurysm. Um, you know, it's still small, it's, but it's still something that can potentially burst. Even, uh, you know, smaller aneurysms than that have burst. And um, so any sort of like big, massive headache that just comes out of nowhere, like a bolt from the blue, um, very severe, 
You just need to get that checked out ASAP. You do not sit on that. I uh, could present as horrible neck pain, horrible headache, those sorts of things. And so bam, horrible headache, horrible pain. You go to the hospital. That's what you do. And you let your family know as well. Very unlikely that that will happen. However, it can happen. That's what you look out for. Um, and you get that surveilled. You get regular imaging with um, uh, with your doctor, with uh, the radiologist or the neurosurgeon, whoever's uh, taking care of that. It's different in different areas. Um, and then if that starts growing or becomes, um, you know, is growing and growing at a quicker rate or something like that, that's when they say, okay, well, we need to, we need to do something about this. You know, you, you can, you don't even necessarily need surgery. There's a lot of endovascular treatments now where they go in and, and coil it from the inside. Um, sometimes they need stents, which is, you know, you'll be on antiplatelets for the rest of your life at that point, which isn't ideal, but a lot of these things you can coil and, um, you know, so that's, uh, that's better, you know, and, um, uh, so you don't necessarily need like a, a craniotomy and go in there and, and do a clipping from the outside. Quite often they'll get these endovascularly. And so it's, it's not the end of the world. I keep an eye on it. You never know four or five years from now, it just disappears. Great. Let us know. You know, again, that's something that we don't, we don't have any data on yet, but if people start seeing that and we start studying that you know that's great but I, my guess is that it won't my guess is that you know you just need to keep an eye on it maybe it helps it stay stable longer uh but maybe not so either way you just get it surveilled and if it starts growing and your doctor thinks that it's time to do something about it i would go with their advice dc thank you for the super chat Causes of acquired atrophy, uh, if not Hashimoto's or low iodine, can it be reversed? I'm assuming, I mean, thyroid atrophy. Um, so there are, there are going to be a lot of causes of low thyroid. I'm going to assume that you're talking about hypothyroidism. Uh, Hashimoto's is a cause of that, low iodine as well. Um, can it be reversed? It depends on what's causing it. it depends on what exposure you've had. There are things called goitrogens in plants. There's a class of, of defense chemical and toxin that cause goiters and stops your thyroid from working properly and your thyroid swells up like crazy. Uh, kale has a lot of goitrogens. They gave these things to sheep and they had massive, you know, like softball sized goiters hanging off their neck. It caused serious neurological dysfunction and problems and stillbirths and all these serious problems. The kale is disgustingly bad for you and bad for livestock. They were giving um, cows kale because they, they just couldn't give this stuff away. And so they were like, cows were eating it and uh, dairy cows and the milk were, was giving people goiters because of all the goitrogens that were now concentrated in the milk. Terrible stuff, terrible, terrible stuff. I, I don't know why anyone would eat kale. First of all, it's disgusting. Second of all, it has all these toxins in it. And the reason it's disgusting is because it has all those toxins in it and your brain recognizes them as bad and sending you a signal in no uncertain terms to spit that garbage out. And, and yet we convince ourselves that we need to eat it. Like you want to eat it, you go ahead. But um, I, I, I did not lose any sleep when I stopped eating that disgusting plant. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of reasons that you can you can box your your thyroid, even just nutritional deficiencies, such as not getting enough zinc. You won't convert T4 into T3, which is the most active uh, form of thyroid hormone. You know, there's a lot of these things. So you know, getting proper nutrition um, and getting away from different sort of toxins and chemicals that can suppress your thyroid. That's what you do, and that's uh, that's what's most beneficial for that. So a lot of those things do get reversed. So when I get people on a uh, carnivore diet absolutely helps it absolutely helps and uh, in most cases their thyroid improves dramatically uh, it certainly helps with uh, Hashimoto's um, and low, I mean even low iodine I mean this, this can you know get you everything that you need depending on your food supply so uh, yes it does depend on what's causing the atrophy but uh, it can help quite a lot of, of those reasons Keith Serp, thank you for the super chat. Love your work. Well, thank you very much. Six weeks carnivore, lost 15 kg. Awesome. That's like nearly, that's like 35 pounds for, for people doing the conversion. Feel amazing. 
Uh, tips on losing stubborn belly fat. Um, should I do fasting? I want to see a six pack. Uh, just keep going. Keep going with what you're doing. I mean, you're, you're six weeks in, you know, I mean, and you've lost 15 kgs. I mean, that, that's fantastic. So, I mean, there's no reason to suspect that's just going to stop there. As long as you're eating enough, you're eating enough fat, because if you're under eating, you're chronically under eating, yeah, you'll lose weight, but then you'll plateau because you'll suppress your metabolism. And that's not what we want to do. We want to, we want to support your metabolism. We want to boost your metabolism. So your body just says, hey, we don't need all this savings. We can actually get rid of this stuff and get down to a more, uh, uh, you know, a, a lower body fat percentage. And, um, and that's when you get that. So, you know, you exercise, you do anaerobic exercise, you lift weights, you do sprints, especially one of the best workouts is sprinting. And, um, and then, uh, and then just keep eating, keep eating the way you are. You know, it, it can take time. You know, I wasn't horribly obese or anything like that. When I started this, I was, I'd always been active. I'd always at least in some sort of exercise. Um, I was playing competitive rugby up until I was 35. And then I was, you know, back helping my folks. And so I sort of wasn't really playing for a couple of years. And then I was 38 and I really wanted to get back into it. I was getting very antsy that I hadn't been able to play. I was actually 37. And then I went and did humanitarian work for a few months. And then I was now 38. And I was like, nope, really want to get back to it now. And I started cornboard. like, night and day difference. I felt like I was 22 again. And I lost like 10 kgs in, in two weeks. And then I stabilized. I didn't lose any fat, any weight after that, but I was losing a lot of fat and I was gaining muscle because I was working out a lot and I was doing a lot of sprinting and I was doing a lot of weightlifting. And even then, you know, I was getting fitter and fitter and fitter and, and my body composition was changing dramatically, but it still took like six, eight months before I got down to a stable body fat percentage when I was just, you know, shredded and muscular and, and, you know, five or 6% body fat, uh, without trying. I mean, it was just, that was, I was eating maximally and that's just where my body wanted me to be. Um, so it just takes time, you know, and we all started different places even where I was, it was, wasn't all that bad. It was, it was bad for me, but it wasn't like, you know, as, as bad as it could have been. Um, you know, it still took time, you know, it still took like six, eight months before I got down to very lean, stable, um, body habits. So, you know, and that was with a lot of hard work and eating perfectly. I didn't eat anything except beef and water. Like that was it. And so, um, you know, it, it just takes time. You're doing great. You've already lost 15 kg. You feel fantastic. The stubborn body that it, if it's still there after six weeks, it's not, it's not technically stubborn yet. You know, give it, give it several months, give it six months, give it a year. You know, if it's just not shifting, then you can call it stubborn and, uh, but the main thing is, is um, uh, lift weights, do sprints, eat enough food. You should be fine. Real Deal McNeil, thank you very much for the question. Um, the question is, been identified having low sodium from blood work um, and constant taste for a lot of salt. Took electrolytes for 30 days, stopped, but getting leg cramps. Do you suggest using electrolytes or not? Uh, for some people, like, look, if you're, if you actually have low sodium, then, you know, adding in more salt, if your body's telling you more salt, more salt, more salt, then yes, there are some people that when you lower your, your insulin levels, you can actually lose more sodium than you, you get back by salting to taste. And so if you're in that category, which it sounds like you may be, and your, your electrolytes are actually low, then you need to make sure that you're supplementing with them. The other side is sometimes people drink a lot of water, a lot more water than their body can handle. And um, so you can wash out the sodium. Um, and that's people that are drinking like gallons of water a day. It's not, I mean, most people are not doing that. Most people are having like, a, you know, I talk to people uh, that you know, say, I was like, oh, well, I drink like, I drink a lot of water. I don't think I could possibly drink more. I drink like, liter and a half, two liters of water. And I'm like, that's like a cup for me. I mean, this is, that's, that's my glass that I use at the house. It's, it's, it's a liter, you know, or you know, like 40 ounces, something like that. Um, I have several of those a day and that's just me. That's just what my body wants. And so, you know, it's, um, uh, yeah. And so, uh, but I don't, I don't have problems with that. And in fact, I get leg cramps when I don't have enough water. 
So if you have less, less sodium than your body wants, generally that doesn't actually make leg cramps. Usually again, that is dehydration. So, you know, you, you sort of, it sounds like you probably need more salt, more sodium. Uh, magnesium can cause leg cramps. I generally don't see that with people with low sodium or, or potassium in the hospital who are very sick because that's really the only time you're going to see someone with like truly low potassium or sodium. Um, but if you have low sodium, if that's been tested as actually low and you have a high taste for salt, eat salt. You know, you need to you need to get get more of that. Generally, that will that will stabilize after a few weeks and your insulin is just staying at this level and your body adjusts to the amount of insulin and how much electrolytes you need to bring in. Uh, but in that in, in that interim, then if you need more salt, then you, you need more salt. So, yeah, definitely add more if you need that. Uh, Jessica Key, thank you very much for the super chat. Um, new to carnivore, I have PSC and ulcerative colitis. I'm experiencing high watery output that lasted well over two weeks. This is is this normal with no colon? Um, yes. Uh, if you don't if you don't have a colon, if you've had that removed, then um, the colon is what what uh, condenses the, the um, you know, the, the, the stool as it comes out of, of the small intestine. And so if it's just coming out straight from the small intestine and out, then that's generally um, uh, just the contents of the small intestine. So that can be very watery. That's, that's quite typical. Um, and so, yeah, that, and, and the thing is too, is that if you're eating a lot of fiber, that sort of makes it solid just because it's uh, it's just this bulk that you can't digest, you can't liquefy, you can't make that, uh, you can't make that, um, uh, you know, break down into, you know, useful things, you know, it's just, it's just indigestible. And, um, you know, so that, that is normal. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just sort of something that, you know, is, is particular to your case. If you've had your colon taken away uh, due to ulcerative colitis. Uh, it's a shame that you, know, you didn't find this before um, that was taken away because ulcerative colitis can be pushed, put into remission with a strict red meat and water diet. I've seen it happen more than once, many, many times. And so, you know, I'm sorry that you had to have that taken away, but the good news is, is that you can still optimize your health from here and you can still have, be very, very healthy and very happy going forward. But Yes, um, you know, high watery output can be can be normal because you, the colon is, is what's condensing it because you're not eating fiber. It's you're not going to have this whole bunch of bulk just sopping up all that stuff. So, uh, yes, that can be normal. I wouldn't worry too much about it. You make sure that you're getting enough water because you, you that's part of the colon's job is to dehydrate and pull back in that water. So, you know, if you're if you're losing more water than you should be. You need to replace that with drinking more water. And there's a nice little chat from my little El Marie saying you're the best. No, you're the best. Uh, very, very good to see you there, sweetie. Nice to see you and say hello. Thank you for doing that. Rajaram uh, Jaya Shankar, thank you very much for the very generous super chat. It's very kind of you. Greeting from Indian, India. Um, can someone on dialysis and injection fraction of 30 be on carnivore? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So like I said before, just anybody with any condition can be on carnivore. And, um, and in fact, with people with serious issues like this, I think it's more important to do that, to, to eat truly appropriate um, nutrition for human beings. And that's what a carnivore diet is. Um, dialysis you know, your sort of end stage renal disease at that point. Um, I have heard of three people now coming off dialysis. I've seen one person now that's working on that, uh, still on dialysis, but is making more urine, which is great. Will they be able to get enough kidney function back to come off dialysis? I don't know, but hopeful. Um, can't say that that's going to happen. The likelihood is they won't be able to come off dialysis, but it's certainly not going to make it worse. I mean, think about that. Uh, if, if your kidneys just don't work at all, you, you can't make them worse, can you, right? 
uh, but they don't make it worse. Meat does not make your kidneys worth work worse. They make it better. Higher protein, higher animal protein makes your kidneys work better. And injection fraction of 30, you're having heart failure, um, is going to be worsened and you're going to put more stress and pressure on your heart when you're putting things in your body that it's not supposed to have. Just by going on a carnivore diet, you're going to have more ketones. You're going to go into a ketogenic state. Your heart prefers ketones. So that could ostensibly improve the cardiac function and the contractility of the heart, potentially. And I have seen a number of people report back to me that their injection, that their ejection fraction has improved. Will that help the person that you're talking about here, be it yourself or others? Uh, I don't know, but there's that potential. And either way, it's going to improve their health in a lot of other ways that is going to make their life a hell of a lot easier to deal with while on dialysis and with an injection fraction of 30. I don't know if it's gonna reverse those issues, but it can certainly help them in a lot of other ways. And, and it's certainly safe. It is not is not a problem for that. Um, it will help if anything. So good luck to them. Um, I'm running short on time, guys. So I'm gonna have to sort of pick through a couple uh, questions here. Um, I might not be able to get to all of them. Uh, Sunflower, thank you for the super chat. Uh, thank you, Dr. C. My daughter feels sick whenever she eats meat. Do you know what is causing this reaction? Um, quite often, it's, it's psychosomatic that we've just been told for our whole life that we're not supposed to eat meat. We're not supposed to eat fat, especially uh, people in adolescence. They, they really don't want to gain weight and put on fat and things like that. So they say, you know, oh, my God, fat's going to make me fat. I can't eat that. And you actually make yourself feel sick. And I have done that to myself. Anytime I would eat like just a chunk of fat because it was fried up and crispy and it smelled amazing, I would it would make me feel physically sick. Oh my god, I can't believe I ate that. Um, and that continued and persisted into uh, adulthood. When I was 38 doing carnivore, knowing full well that fat was good for me, I was trimming off the fat. I'm like, well, what the hell am I doing? I, the, like the fat's good for me. Eat the damn fat. And but even then, I could I couldn't do it. My body was rebelling because I had trained and conditioned myself. To not eat this stuff and to and to give myself a visceral reaction, negative reaction when I ate it, and so I had to relearn my learn it and retrain myself, and um, and so I did, um, and so she can do that too. I mean, if she's just eating meat and at first it tastes good, and then eventually it stops tasting good, well, that's just her body telling her to stop. She doesn't need to eat that much. It may be that her body doesn't need nearly as much as she thinks it does, but if it's just the aversions. Um, that from a conditioned response, then just, just work slowly but surely to decondition that. Just find the meats that she likes, find the meats that taste good to her um, and that she enjoys, and then just focus on that and, and keep working up. If it's if she can only do sort of lean meats at the moment, fine. Just try to work in a bit more fat and a bit more fat and a bit more fat. Cut off a slice of fat, a little piece of fat, put it with a lean piece, eat it together. Tastes good when you do that. And so... Uh, just sort of try to recondition uh, that and um, and you know if her body's just telling her not to eat not to eat you know a period of fasting I mean eating once a day is fine you know eating once every two days is generally fine for most people if that's what your body is telling you to do and so it could be that you just don't eat that day and the next day meat tastes great and she really wants it and doesn't feel sick but generally if she feels sick she's either eating past it it tasting good or more likely it's a condition response that just needs to be deconditioned. Uh, carnivore power of healing. Thank you for the super chat. Attacked by two German dogs one and a half years ago. Um, sorry to hear that. Um, started six meters at 265 pounds, gained 40, um, 40 pounds, now 280 lion diet since uh, 1st of January, um, even started YouTube over 40 videos to show you can work out uh, every day, 50 years old, five foot three, numbness, pain, and, and morbidly fat. Um, well, that's great that you've uh, you started a channel and you started on, on the lion diet and are, are being active. And so, you know, people, you know, check them out, you know, see some of those videos. Like it's, um, it's great to see more and more people um, doing channels and showing their healing and, and doing it from the beginning. You know, it's like we don't need to hide this, right? You don't just have to show people and said, hey, I did this. This was me before. 
And now two years after the fact, here's the result. It's great when people are doing this in real time and people can see their, their results in real time and seeing them getting better in real time. And it's not a cakewalk for everyone. Some people do have teething issues. They do have problems they have to get through, but they get, they get through them and they get better. And there's, there are things that can, can improve. And so, you know, that's important. That's important for people to see so that when they run into them themselves, they don't just go, Oh, something's wrong. I've got to abort. Uh, no, this is normal. This is something that can happen to people and, and you get through it and you've seen other people get through it and you're going to get through it. And so that's great. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for making a channel and uh, yeah, good luck with that. I hope it, I hope it goes well. Linda Anger, uh, thank you for a super chat. Just says, thank you. Well, you're very welcome. I'm, I hope that my answer earlier was helpful. Um, Alan Myber, thank you very much for the super chat. Can you speak to high homocysteine levels and high blood pressure and trimethyl glycine supplementation, um, as was mentioned on Joe Rogan podcast? Is there anything else you would suggest around this? Well, I, I didn't see that Joe Rogan podcast, so I don't know exactly what they spoke about. I'm not too familiar with trimethyl methyl glycine supplementation, but I can tell you that homocysteine is a, is a molecule that uh, becomes more abundant when our B12 and, and uh, folate are low. And so you can get your homocysteine levels up, which can irritate the, the interior lining of our arteries, can cause damage to the lining of our arteries and actually cause that, the, that, that sort of clotting structure, um, structural sort of uh, changes that we see in atherosclerosis, right? If you look at the, uh, the dynamics of the, of the blood vessel um, and, the, and the arteries, um, cholesterol, even if it were cholesterol molecules that were getting in, into the, the lining of the tissue. Um, there's no way for them to get in there. Even the smallest cholesterol molecules cannot physically penetrate that barrier. And it's not gonna go through the cell because it, ha it, ha it takes active transport to transport these molecules into the cell and out the other side. So that's not happening, right? Um, so it has to be damaged. There has to be some sort of abrasion and cut in the, in the artery that can then get this thing. Even if it is cholesterol getting in there, which it's not, there's something else going on. Um, you have potentially macrophages that are sucking up a bunch of damaged cholesterol, and then the macrophage is going into this damaged area of the artery lining to fix it, and then building up or whatever, or blood vessels going in there, making a clot, those clots, you know, um, turning into plaques and scars, and a lot of cholesterol being left over because that's what blood cells are made out of. Their cell membrane is cholesterol. And, um, and or even plant sterols, you know, mac macrophages suck up the plant sterols, but they hate them. And so they've been actually shown to dump these things in the lining of arteries, like in AAAs, like um, um, abdominal aortic aneurysms, right? So a lot, a lot more going on here, but um, homocysteine can damage the lining of the, of the artery walls. And so just making sure you have enough B12 and folate reduces homocysteine, reduces that damage from the homocysteine to your artery lining. So it's going to reduce that clotting that's going to happen, that damage and scarring and buildup to your, that, that can happen with homocysteine and um, can reduce blood pressure from that, from that mechanism. But also from a carnivore point of view, right, you're getting a whole bunch of B12, you're getting a whole bunch of B6. And, you know, that's great, especially if you're having a bit of liver because there's, there's a lot more folate in liver than there is in muscle meat. Um, so it's, um, it is the case that when you go on a carnivore diet and get rid of sugars and carbs and all that sort of stuff, your blood sugar comes down, your insulin comes down, insulin resistance and uh, higher levels of insulin can cause uh, the uh, stiffening of your arteries so they're not able to move and contract and loosen and expand. And so they just stay tight and rigid, pressure goes up in the system. And so there are a lot of reasons why going on a carnivore diet not, can improve your blood pressure, not only just because of getting your insulin down, but also improving your, your nutritional status, which can improve other things, not, not least of which is homocysteine. Homocysteine will go down and you'll improve from that regard as well. So hopefully that was helpful. I don't, I don't know about all the other stuff though. Um, okay. Let me see. 
Um, okay, so here's uh, here's one from uh, Benotris. Um, thank you for the super chat. Love from Tazzy. Doing carnivore in the van life, beef, lamb, and animal fats, bone broth, and salt, sometimes fish. Opinion on canned tuna daily as a snack. Uh, uh, it's fine. It's just super lean. Um, and so you need to add fat to that, probably butter, grass-fed butter. It's better. Mayonnaise is not, unless you make your own out of animal fats, is no good. It's generally made of soybean oil and other sort of garbage that you don't want. And so I would not, I would not touch it. Um, and um, so, yeah, so I, I just wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that stuff with a 10 foot pole. And, um, and uh, so, but you need fat. It's very, very lean. So, you know, you need it, but just add fat to it, like uh, grass fed butter, something like that. Um, okay. Um, all right. I think I'm going to just answer this one really quick and then probably call it there. And I've got to, I've got to get to the office. Um, um, Maricel Tomas, thank you for the super chat. I want to buy grass-fed meat. Unfortunately, there's not much I can find here in Hawaii. Any companies that ship to Hawaii, I could order from. Um, the answer to that is I don't know, but maybe someone here does know and can put that in the comments. And so if you do know, I mean, there are things like, um, you know, butcher box, um, et cetera, that can, that can ship meats. I don't know if they ship to Hawaii, but they, they seem to ship around the country. And there are a lot of other companies as well that do ship direct from, from the farm to your door and, um, could very well potentially do that. I mean, I think that, um, you yeah, know, I mean, I think that even, uh, what's his face, his Facebook guy, he has a big herd of <laughs> cows on on um hawaii now don't know if he's planning on selling them or just stocking up for the the apocalypse but um it's uh you know it is possible that some of these companies will will ship over there so if anybody knows that if anybody knows some of these companies that ship or know of companies that ship that potentially could do it you know please do put that in the in the comments down below and um Hopefully that can that can get back to you and uh, maybe try one of those those sites to to see if that will help. Um, all right, let's see if there's any. Oh, Christ. Um, let's see if there's any questions here on Instagram. Um, so here's one question from on Instagram from Chris uh, Chris Chris Schaffman. Who says uh, carnivore diet is carnivore diet likely to help my friend with multiple sclerosis who has significant fatigue pretty much daily? Uh, yes, uh, I did. I specifically did a, um, a podcast with uh, a lady. Uh, she went by Dr. Sarah. She didn't want to use her full name for professional reasons, um, but she's a PhD in biostatistics. So she does you know high level uh, medical research and. Um, and she had multiple sclerosis, and and I say had because um, she went from being in a wheelchair and basically paralyzed and dying because this can be fatal um, to going on a carnivore diet. And she had followed a protocol where she's taking high dose vitamin D. And people can watch that episode to to get more on that um, and vitamin D and carnivore diet. And in six months. She was not only out of her wheelchair, but she was back doing ballet, which is pretty amazing. And so she's not the only person that I've seen improve multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition, and I have yet to see a single autoimmune condition that does not respond extremely well to a carnivore diet, especially when it's just a red meat and water diet, high fat, um, you know, two to one grams of fat to protein if you can, unless that's causing you diarrhea. And so that's... Um, that can absolutely help. Absolutely help. It has helped in the past. I would expect it to help here in this case. And, uh, and hopefully it does because it's, um, you know, that's a very, very devastating illness. You know, Dr. Sarah, she was, um, you know, because she really knows her stuff from a, from a clinical, uh, from a, um, an academic point of view, being able to read these studies, you know, she was getting worse and worse. And she was like, okay, what the hell can I do? The medications aren't helping. I'm on my way out. I need to figure something out. 
or else I'm, I'm done for. And so she started, she came across the carnivore stuff and she started looking into it, she started looking at the studies, looking at the things that, that I'm referencing, that other people are referencing. And she knows how to read a study. She writes studies. And so she looked at it and she said, you know, the, you know, these people are onto something They're like, there is, there is something here. And, um, and so she tried it and it worked. And so, you know, I would expect it to work for your friend too. And I hope that it does. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate you guys coming on. I think I went for three hours that time, which is, you know, it's nice to be able to do sometimes. Um, I, I might have mornings like this going forward on Fridays before going in on uh, uh, for clinic because I have a, a bit more time sometimes. And, uh, and we can, we'll do a, a longer session like this. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you all for joining. Please do share this with anyone who you find this helpful. Please do comment below with what you thought or any other sort of thoughts uh, to the, uh, everything that we've spoken about here and continue the discussion in, in the comments because that's always great for people to see um, that helps them, uh, helps elucidate different sorts of points for them as well. So thank you all very much for joining here on YouTube and on Facebook and Instagram. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys uh, for the premiere this Sunday in the U.S., Monday morning in Australia. Uh, try to get as many people there as possible because it really makes a huge difference. And if you haven't uh, subscribed, please do think about that and hitting the like button and leaving a comment because it's very helpful. Hello. And um, little El Marie's here too, so I've got to go. Thank you all very much. We'll see you for the premiere and then the live next week. I might start adding in another live. Uh, during the week as a regular edition um, on top of the sort of ones where I join in with other people. So I might do that on Tuesdays in, in America, Wednesdays in uh, Australia on the days that I can. So, okay. And uh, interview on ketogenic women right before the premiere. Makes sense. Yes. And, uh, oh, and also I'm doing an IG live tonight, uh, Instagram live tonight at 8 p.m. Perth time which would be 12 noon in the UK and bloody early for anyone in America. So I apologize for that. Um, but uh, yeah, doing that as well and um, doing IG Live, I'll be a guest on someone else's channel in the UK who will be asking about uh, whatever they ask about. So if anyone is available for that, please do stop by and I will see you guys then. Great. Thanks a lot, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you for coming.